Oh, we've got, as they come again. Yeah. Right so we've got eight in the room. We've got eight in the room so we can get started. Yeah. It's a five. All right. Okay. So over the, the record, is fine. Fine. we're going to have a meeting. Uh, well, one is it there? Suggested. Share screen. Oh, this is me. Oh. Are these on? Mm -hmm. First. Oh, first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Sarah is fine. Hi, second. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Am I good to go? Um, so just wanted to give you a quick update on where we are with accreditation. Believe it or not, I think most of you were here five years ago when we went through reaccreditation. Um, it's that time again. So um, for those of you who may not have gone through the accreditation cycle with us in the past, I'm just going to provide some background information slide. Um, so accreditation is a process that we go through. There is over a, probably 150 agencies that in the country that are accredited. Um, it really looks um, at all of the 150 plus standards that are required for agencies to meet, which are really the best practices in the fields of park and recreation. Um, and we submit, um, I think we submitted close to a thousand pieces of evidence to show that we were meeting the over 150 standards um, that are required. Um, so CAPRA, for those of you who may not have been around the last time that we went through accreditation, um, it's a commission of accreditation of park and recreation agencies. Um, and there is a 15 member board um, that's comprised of park and recreation professionals, um, leadership from different organizations um, around the country, and are really experts in the fields of park and recreation. And ultimately, they are the individuals that will make the decision of, about whether or not we are reaccredited. Um, so this just gives you a sample. Actually, now there is a close to 200 agencies that are accredited um, throughout the country. Um, and this will be our fourth time going through the accreditation process for the Park Authority. So these are the different chapters um, that are um, comprised of the accreditation standards. It's everything from how we plan our parks to how we program, um, to how we manage our human resources, how you, we evaluate what we do. Um, and within each of the chapters, there's anywhere from 10 to uh, 25 standards that we need to meet. Um, each of the chapters were assigned to different divisions who were responsible for gathering the evidence of compliance that we need um, to demonstrate that we're meet, meeting the standards. Um, this is an example of one of the standards. You all are very familiar with our land acquisition process and procedures. Um, and uh, we're required to produce evidence that we have a park acquisition procedure um, and that we're implementing the procedure. So the accreditation process, um, the first part of the process annually, we submit an annual report um, and through that annual report, we confirm that we're continuing to meet the standards. So for the last four years, um, we have confirmed even during COVID that we are continuing to meet the accreditation standards. Um, and then we go through the process of reapplying for accreditation. Um, over the last five years, we've been gathering the evidence of compliance. Um, and within the 100, 150 plus standards, um, there's evidence really from every part of the organization, from emergency action plans, from our sites, to programs, to uh, media releases, from our public information office, to policies and procedures, from human resources. So literally there are dozens of staff throughout the Park Authority that are gathering the evidence of compliance to make sure that we meet the accreditation standards. Um, there's the initial review. So we um, submitted our self-assessment, which was required 10 weeks prior to our visit. Um, and our visit is gonna be a little bit different. So in the past, we've invited the visit team on site. You all met the visit team. We had tours of our parks um, and they spent several days in the director's office conference room reviewing our evidence of compliance. Um, since COVID, um, for agencies that are going through reaccreditation, the visits are happening virtually. 
<laughs> so um, this will be a new experience for us. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to tour our parks and show um, all that Fairfax County Park Authority has to offer, um, but we will be demonstrating how we meet the evidence of compliance through the evidence that we provided, as well as um, we're preparing some videos that we'll share with the visit team that um, demonstrates how we're meeting the pillars that are outlined by the National Recreation and Park Association. So that virtual visit is currently scheduled for June 12th through the 16th. Um, hopefully on the 16th, we will receive a good report from our visit team. Um, we have three visitors coming from various states um, around the country who will be part of the team that will review our evidence. Um, and then hopefully on the 16th, they will give us a thumbs up that we have met the standards that are required. Um, so we don't actually know whether or not we are reaccredited until the NRPA conference um, in October, um, but we will have a pretty good idea of how we did um, when the visit team leaves on the 16th. Um, as I mentioned before, there are about 100, there are 154 standards. Um, there are 36 of those standards that are fundamental, which means that we cannot be reaccredited um, unless we meet can all I, of those. I'm 36. sorry, can I pause you? Sure. It shows on the screen that just, Cynthia yeah, Carter just oh, is waiting to. I looked over to show that she was in the waiting room. Sorry. Yeah. You there or just still joining? There we go. There she is. All right, let's do the song and dance. Let's check her. I'm sure we can hear her before we. <laughs> Dr. Carter, can you hear us? Hello. Oh. Okay. Yay. <laughs> I can hear you now. Great. All right, just hang on and we'll read you in uh, officially. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I am Kyle Stone and I call the April 26, 2023 Park Authority Board Meeting to order. Virginia law authorizes the remote participation of board members provided that a policy exists to ensure that such remote participation is consistently administered. This board has approved policy 111, remote participation in public meetings. Any such remote attendance must be approved by the board as long as a physical quorum of the board is actually present. Voice of the remote participant is able to be heard by everyone in the room and the remote participation comports with the policy. Uh, there will be only got one member at right now participating remotely and they have received preliminary approval. Dr. Carter, are you connected to this meeting remotely? Yes, I am. And you're calling from where? I'm participating from my home in <laughs> I started to say Lee District, my, my home in Franconia District. Thank Great. you. I move that Dr. Carter's voice may be adequately heard in this location. I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Pursuant to the Park Authority's Policy 111 for remote participation in public meetings, I move that Dr. Cindy Jacobs Carter um, be permitted to participate remotely in this meeting because it comports with the policy we adopted and a physical quorum is present here at the Park Authority Boardroom, 9th floor Heritage Building. Do I have a second? I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. We're good. Sarah, back to you. So I think I was talking about fundamental standards. There are 36 fundamental standards. If we miss one of those, um, unfortunately, we'll not be reaccredited, but happen. Um, then the, of the 100 and there are 118 remaining standards, um, we have to meet 112 of those standards or 95% um, to be reaccredited. Um, I think many of you are aware um, for the last three times that we've been through the accreditation, we've never missed a standard. Um, so that is the bar that we work towards. <clears throat> Slide is me. Um, so many people, and we often look at this after we complete the accreditation process, whether or not we should continue to be accredited. 
Um, you know, if you visit a local hospital, most hospitals are accredited, schools are accredited. Um, and obviously there is a value to meeting the best practices in the field. Um, after we go through the grueling process of reaccreditation each time, we all we always talk to the staff to say, is it worth it? Um, and I think unanimously, we've always agreed that although the process is grueling, it's a lot of work, it keeps us accountable to meeting the best practices in the field. It ensures that we're updating our plans on a regular basis, um, that we are updating our policies, you are part of that process. Um, and we're really evaluating what we do to make sure that we're doing the best we can for the Fairfax County community. Um, since 2019, there have been three new standards that have been added. Um, one was related to social media. Um, I can't remember the other two, um, but they were standards that um, it, one was related to how staff would be using um, uh, social media. Um, and so they were very relevant in standards that we did not have an issue meeting. I would say that this was probably one of the most challenging, most challenging reaccreditation cycles that I've been through because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Clearly, we were significantly impacted during COVID. Our focus was on keeping our staff safe, not necessarily on making sure we were making uh, meeting the accreditation standards. And throughout the last five years, you've also seen the turnover that's happened in the organization. So um, there was a lot that we did to make sure that we were bringing staff up to speed. Um, and there were a lot of new staff that really stepped up in the end to get things done um, to make sure that we were meeting the accreditation um, standards. Um, again, our visit is scheduled for June 12th through the 16th. Um, we anticipate receiving questions over the next couple of weeks. We haven't received any questions yet, although we do know that they're reviewing the evidence that they received a couple of weeks ago. Um, as I mentioned before, we have three visitors, one from Ohio, another from Florida, and another one from South Carolina. Um, and so they will be the team that reviews all of the documents that we have prepared. Any questions for me? So, uh, well, thank you for a great presentation, first sure. of all. Uh, I, I think, I believe this is my third thing uh, with something there. It used to be 144 points before, if I remember correctly, before they added these, right? I can't remember. And you've- a, 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 It's always, but it's about, been 100, about yes, 150. You pretty much answered most of the question. And because I was thinking about that, uh, how did uh, this, COVID and our turnover impacted our readiness towards this. So that's one part. And you've already answered that. If you could just elaborate on that a little bit. And also the other thing I was going to ask is that, that generally we know that the benefits of this that you said that it's 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 our, our accountability and it 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 uh, basically uh, keeps an in keeps us in check and everything. And we know we have a matrix to measure how we are doing from outside. Right. That basically is there any other benefit of this other than that we have already talked about? Um, you know, I think for for me coming into the organization, I I led the the team when I first started, and there was no way for me better way for me to get to know the organization by going through this process. So, and I, and I think that's a tool for us now with so much turnover happening within the organization, having all of our policies, plans, procedures documented, it gives staff something to refer to. Yeah, let's do work with. Yeah. yeah. So it helps with that succession planning so, as well. Like being a small business owner, I know that we have a better business bureau that if you get accredited with that, that reflects good on you. Sure. But that, that, that's the economical side. My, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there any benefit of this other than what- Tangible you benefits, yeah. yes. Um, you know, I think that there are some agencies that use the accreditation standards to say that we're not meeting this maybe because we don't have adequate administrative offices or administrative support. Therefore, we're going to miss a standard. And so they use that as a tool for advocacy to get funding. For us, we're meeting most of those things, um, but it's always something that we, we consider when we're asking for budget requests as it relates to accreditation. Any other question? I, I, I just want to say, I just want to say when I joined the board, I thought this was really a waste of time. I was like, why are we doing this? It, it takes all this time, all this energy, all this effort. And after we got through the first one, I completely changed my mind because 
what it does, I think, is it puts a deadline. Yeah. There are all these plans, all these things that, yeah, we're going to get to that. Right. There's always the, I'm going to get to that stack of stuff that's important, but it's not pressing. You bet already all the time. And this puts a deadline on all of that. I got to get to it, but it's not pressing stuff that is important. And I think, and and if nothing else, because I mean, because it is, it's a huge investment of staff time. Absolutely. I mean, from yes. that perspective, Every, everyone back right. There. And so I was like, aren't there better things we can do with our lives, and that, that these people can? Call it? <laughs> but it's all of that, not pressing, but important. And I think that that's really the biggest benefit. It makes yes. it makes us focus on those sure. things. Yeah. I mean, I don't see any downside of this. No. <laughs> So a couple of things I wanted to mention, and Mike actually kind of touched on one uh, a little bit, and uh, I guess I have the nerve to maybe broach these subjects because Bill's not here. <laughs> but anyway, he be watching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> clearly, <laughs> clearly, hopefully he'll calm down before I see him in person after some of these comments I'm going to make. Um, so my my personal opinion is. Uh, that it actually is somewhat a waste of time okay if we're not meeting these standards being the size park authority we are where we are um, in fairfax county one of the richest counties you know in the country or whatever we're doing something wrong so we better be meeting all of these standards but this whole program as we just went through it we're going to be judged by other government agencies okay yes so i'm like absolutely should we do this absolutely do we have to say that we're accredited and proudly accredited but this is absolutely not the most important measurement of a park authority and we need to be focused on if we are meeting the needs yes. of our constituents and there's not strong measures in this program to demonstrate that there's strong measures about organization and best practices and this and that, but are we meeting the needs of Fairfax County residents should be our primary focus. You know, what they think of us, not what this group of people thinks about us, not how we measure up to these standards. So absolutely, let's roll forward. We got to do this thing. But just because we're accredited doesn't mean we're perfect. Yeah, I guess that's that, that was my point about the pressing. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's true, but you have to. There are two two sides of this. One side is that that the deliverance and day to day deliverance that we know that our staff is wonderful. They try their best day in day out. They are at the top of the game, and we have to keep up with that. Yeah, you can't drop the ball. You have to keep the eye on the ball. So that's fine. These are two separate parallel things. Yeah, it's not either or. But yeah. at the same time, what makes me think is when you're talking across the street for the, all the fights that we have. This gives us another talking point. It, it absolutely does. Okay. But a couple unhappy constituents absolutely. talking to the people across the street yes. uh, can have a significant effect uh, well, also on, on, on the sentiment yeah. across the street. So again, I look at this as a minimum standard, yes. but not a measure of whether we're doing a perfect job. I think the so. clarification would be that we need both. We need to focus uh, on both. Hey, that's we what I started my comments one. with. And, but there's definitely, I don't see any downside of this per se, but again, like well, the battle. We have to do this. Yes. Yeah. We have to do it. But again, I but agree it, with you. But, that but it doesn't theory. mean we're perfect. If it's we not can. a focus. This is our important, this is part of the. All these uh, things are a focus, but they're to... part of the focus. So um, when you're, and Sarah's giving me the evil eye. I know why she's giving me the evil eye. So. Please don't take the fact that we are CAPRA accredited and it's a smooth sailing and we've, we've, we've met every standard as a given at all. I don't care how large you are. I happen to have come from a large agency and we can talk about our experience in that offline at any point in time. And I can tell you about, um, about that. We are one of 14 in Virginia of 133 in Virginia. Um, there are three th over 3,000 park and rec agencies in the country, and under 200 of them are capital accredited. This is not easy. And I think that when we're talking about the benefit to our agency, the benefit, to the, it's easy to say right now because we're so well balanced and we do do things at the baseline, you know, well, we are not perfect, but we are 
focusing on our conservation and we're focusing on our active recreation, we're doing everything. That can quite literally go this way with a different board and a different director who says, I don't care about the environment, all we're gonna focus on are rec centers. And CAPRA <clears throat> makes you have to have, it's everything. It tells you what a, a well-rounded park system. So when you are a well-rounded park system, it seems like it's just a check the box type of a thing, but it easily allows us to not start to do this and slide towards one way or the other. And it sort of keeps us um, accountable in general. It means something when you say that you work for or you run or a CAPRA accredited agency. Um, I, I get what yours, they're volunteers who go through it. It's not other agencies per se. It's volunteers that that go out to, to, to are equipped to do it. It's the same thing with our gold medal. They're volunteers for the uh, same Academy, National Academy of Accredit of Academy of Academy of Park and Rec. Yeah, administrators who do the the gold medal. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's a group of volunteers who I could, you know, who vote on on the thing. It's it's a way to keep it, you know, sort of even keeled, and that we know we're we're going in the in the direction. And while I have the thing, I just want to say these two women right here, Allison and, and Sarah. You know, and not that anybody said, but I'm speaking. So I just wanted to, just, I mean, they're different people today because they've hit the return button um, <laughs> on Capra. So I just want to take time to thank them, you know, <laughs> as well. Seriously, there we're, we're, ta we're chatting and yeah, sorry. So yeah, so this is, this is, this is like, like Leno said that this is, we have to do this and we, at the same time, we have to keep an eye on the, on our goal, main focus is there. But this is kind of, I look at it like an annual physical. Yes. So this is, we have to do this because it, it, it enables us to do what we need to do and gives us talking points as well. So uh, Dr. Carter, you had a question, please? Yeah, yes. Um, I agree with what has been said, especially um, uh, by Jay just now. I think it is totally important that we're not just petting ourselves on the back, but we do have another entity that is doing that. In addition to that, I think we are leaders. So it's great that we have others. I'm not, I'm just uh, talking about other uh, park authorities that look to us. And this is our stamp of approval and a way of speaking with them. Uh, we can be mentors, we can be leaders. And I just think that this is the gold seal that seals our uh, really strength in this area. So I think is very important, professionally speaking. So that's my two I think cents. Sarah described it very aptly, not like this, but I'm going to put a twist on it. The gold medal is a beauty pageant and Capra is a job interview. That's the difference. It's you're looking under the hood in Capra. It's not in there and with, with reference checks and, you know, and, and whatever it is, whereas gold medal, you're focusing on the stuff that, you, that looks the, the best and you're not showing them a, par, a derelict park. So, so let yeah. me just kind of re-summarize. Um, what I uh, said, and I, I, of course, to all your points, I started what I said and ended my my speech of this is important yes. and, and 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 whatever. But we do um, this is important, but it's not everything. Mm -mm. It, it it doesn't mean that we're accredited. We can coast now. It. it that's that's the only point I'm, I'm yeah. trying to I put that in her. I don't think it's everything. No, I put that in her in her review. Just don't yeah. go. Yeah. No, it's just that's, yeah. that's, 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 no, and it, it does, no, it does, right. it does take a right. lot of effort. And frankly, and I've been through it what three times now, too, or something like that. Or you know, the, this is the third time, I think. Yeah, this is the third time for me too. And staff does a stellar, Absolutely. excellent Absolutely. job. And I know it's a lot of hard work. Anyway. It's important, but it's and not the physical. only thing. This is what it's it, we have to go thing. through this to know mm -hmm. not just power. If there is any shortcoming, we will know through this process. That's, no, that's, that's not true. There's shortcoming <laughs> in our organization and our plans and all those other things, but in our customer satisfaction mm -hmm. and how the public perceives us, it doesn't measure that real well. That's my point. But whatever it measures for that. Yeah. But it requires that we measure customer satisfaction. And there's many agencies that don't even do that. Yeah. So it it provides the baseline to do everything that you're you're saying. Yeah. You know, we didn't have a natural or cultural resource management plan. It's where you start, but it's not where you stop. A absolutely. It is the best practice. It's yes, I'm not a question, just um, another value added. Um for 
uh, many of our staff who are in the trenches day to day with uh, difficult tasks. Um, I, I think such recognition is is an opportunity to say we're pretty damn good. Absolutely. And I think that's value to the organization. Um, so um, y'all are doing pretty damn good. <laughs> we'll see. So, uh, well, we, we, you have been doing pretty yes, damn good. But anyway, I, I think it's an opportunity for the staff uh, to be affirmed in, in their dedication to providing the, the best services to the county uh, in the park system. So um, I think that's something to celebrate when we're when the staff is recognized. Questions? Yes, with that, we're done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I have adjourned the question board management meeting. You. Ken? Okay, I'll call the Planning Development Committee to order. Uh, there's one correction. Uh, you'll notice on the agenda, both items are listed as information. That is correct. On the supporting material, I understand. Uh, one of the items was listed as an action item, but that is not correct. So both information items. Who's up? So while Katie's walking up, I just want to give you a little bit of an intro into, um, and she's going to talk talk about the PARA um, that she's worked so hard on working. I just want to make it, you've seen this before. This is what everybody's been in the blue map and she'll show it on, on top. The reason why um, I asked her to come and give a, um, uh, presentation is so that you understand the background. Well, first to give credit for all of the work that she does. A lot of times we just see something and think, oh, it's magic, magically happens. I would like everybody to see, you know, um, all of the hard work that went in, but just to understand the data when we're talking about them, whether or not it's in PROSA or through planning or through activation or through whenever we're talking about this, I, I, I want you to understand that there are layers and a lot of um, data that goes goes with it. So you guys have now walked up, so I'll turn it over to you. And Jay pretty much said everything I was going to say to uh, introduce Katie. Uh, <laughs> I know she's talked a little bit before, but just another uh, one of our um, amazing team members who has uh, really put something together that makes sense. This is a place where uh, she's going to explain uh, this index and let us have a chance to talk about it uh, so we can all understand it before we get into some of these bigger uh, prosa pieces and things coming up in the uh, coming weeks. Katie. Thank you. Um, hello, all. I am Katie Miga. I'm the business analytics supervisor in the business office. Um, so as Jay said, you have seen this data before. This isn't anything brand new. Um, you'll see the map on your screen. That is the vulnerability index that has been around in the county since about 2019. And I know the Park Authority was one of the first agencies countywide to really start using it. Um, so the vulnerability index has those five categories you can see in the map from that cream um, color being very low up into very high within the darkest blue. Um, I also know you've heard the term opportunity areas a lot. Um, Jay, I know has used that term in presentation. So that's just the high and very high areas um, within the vulnerability index in here. So the Park Authority Racial Equity Index, which is a mouthful, so I'll just say PARE, um, from here on out is simply an enhancement to the vulnerability index. So I wanted to give some context for why we use this index, why we use the vulnerability index, and now why um, we're gonna be using the PARE and what the purpose of it is. Um, so the index is simply a composite of indicators that produces a single score. So the PARE is used to highlight disparities within a geographical area. So this could be any sub-county geographical area. We could look at planning districts, supervisor districts, drive time areas, so anything that's sub-county. Um, and this really allows leadership and staff to be able to make data-informed decisions, to have that understanding of, of the population and how it's um, dispersed across the county. The PARE presents the current state of the county, so that can really help us guide equitable service delivery and, and resource allocation. So a little bit of background on why we decided we needed to create the PARE rather than depending on the vulnerability index. So in the original iterations of the vulnerability index, it's updated every year, population of color was one of the eight indicators. Last year, uh, Carla Bruce, the chief equity officer for the county, decided to remove population of color 
because your race and ethnicity is not an inherent vulnerability, which of course it is not. So she decided to remove that, replaced it with um, a different indicator within the vulnerability index. Um, however, that now made the vulnerability index solely socioeconomic indicators. So there's no way to do any sort of racial equity analysis if there's no racial information within the vulnerability index. So we decided we would add the population of color to it. So not discard all, you know, all the work that we've done with the vulnerability index, but take those eight indicators in the vulnerability index and that score. So that's 75% of the PARE score and 25% of the PARE score comes from the population of color. And therefore, again, we can use the PARE as we had used the vulnerability index previously um, to evaluate decisions through an equity lens. So this is the PARE map by block group. Again, it's still using those same categories from very low up to very high. It looks very similar. The opportunity areas, so the map on your right, you can see the opportunity areas that are simply in black were opportunity areas with the vulnerability index. The opportunity areas with those hash marks on it are additional opportunity areas that were identified by adding in the population of color to the vulnerability index. So when you say PARE only opportunity area, that means it's only through PARE that it was found. Yes. So if we were doing opportunity areas just by the vulnerability index, none of those areas. I would just, be I would just, when I'd read through it, I was trying to understand the, yes. on, the term only. Yes. So, okay. Yes. Um, so opportunity areas using the PARE would be any populations that are socioeconomically vulnerable. So those that would appear um, in the vulnerability index as well but also areas that have average socioeconomic, so it would fall in the average category in the vulnerability index, but has high concentrations of people of color. That's the hash marks? Yeah, so those are the hash marks, are those that pop out. So there's something wrong because the biggest hash mark on the whole map there, the one to the south, mm -hmm. is a landfill and a park with virtually no residential units at all. I mean, I can go back and look at the data. There could potentially be, you know, a small residential area that, according to the census data, is in. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see it if you could get back to me on that because I, I think it's just completely it's that one that's right on the the, the, the southernmost one. Okay, that's yeah. that's that's the Lorton landfill, and, it, and it's the it's north, north and, and no, it's be, yeah, yeah, based on census data. So if there's any people living there, even depending on how large that census. Yeah, there. even if it's like a small neighborhood piece that they have within that block group. Yeah, and I'm familiar with those neighborhoods and no. Yeah, I don't know the area, so I don't know. <laughs> so, so just let, let's, I, I just want to know what the anomaly is that created mm -hmm. that. Okay. Because it so, is the biggest one on there. Well, at, well, the biggest block group, but yes. Yeah. Okay. But actually what he just said, so this is based on this doesn't take into account the amount of population that might be in one of these areas. Correct. I mean, they try to make every block group have about the same population numbers. So if the block group is spatially smaller, it just means it's theoretically denser. it's supposed to be a denser area. Yes. Yeah. So yes. that could just mean that there's a very small amount of housing no, because it's the landfill right. and the water treatment plant and whatever else is right. Yeah, it might pick up some little teeny tab. It's I can't tell by the scale of the map, but if, if, if there was anything there, it would be on the extreme northern edge of it. I mean, just a pencil spec size. Poten yes, potentially. And there are, I know there's three census tracts. I think it's also three or four block groups. So Dulles Airport, um, where the CIA is, is a block group. And then Fort Belvoir North. Never show is just blank because they have it as a block group, but there's zero population. Right. So those are always pulled out. So there must be some minimal amount of population. Yeah, my curiosity area. is real high. So if you let me know when yep. you figure it out, let me know. Yep, definitely. So uh, okay, if, if I mean I understand. So if you pull out the the factor related to a, a population of color, you would be left with. The vulnerability index more or less on the left, and none of the opportunity areas on the are showing on the right, or or, no, no, or so just that, or that or it's the hash, it's the hash. Yes, the hash marks okay. would be gone. Thank so you. any of those with the hash marks would be gone. And so just for context to see how the population and households is distributed across um, the categories. So this shows 
how many are within you know, each of those five categories. Uh, so for opportunity areas, there are a little over 30% of households are reside in those opportunity areas and nearly 32% of the county population live in opportunity areas. And this just gives context as far as like the racial um, ethnic breakdown across those different groups. So you could see countywide, and this is using 2020 census data. So countywide, we are now 47% white and 53% population of color. So you can see how that breakdown changes across the different categories, very low being you know 68% white and 32% population of color. And that split changes as you go from very low all the way up into very high. And I'm sorry, this is probably very obvious to everyone else, but uh, it's going for me. What is very low and very high measuring? So very low would be very low as far as vul socioeconomic vulnerability, as far as the vulnerability index, or very low. In other words, it, the very low is it's not very vulnerable. And correct. very high is it's very, very vulnerable. vulnerable. Yes, Got you. correct. Got so you. let Thank me you. understand this again. Um, in the categories, what of the categories at the very bottom fall into the definition of people of color everything but white or what is so we're for the very low category no no for it, it yeah, I mean, kind of for any 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 category when, when when you when you is non-white when you determine that yes oh, when you well, we, in your index to the uh, so i'm sorry in the in the index yes. what is included <laughs> in the definition of color population of color. So it would be, so it's basically the opposite of white non-Hispanic. So white non-Hispanic is considered white. Okay. So whether you're white Hispanic, you're considered population of color, also including all of the black or African-American, Asian, that's all population. That was what, that, that's why I was trying to clarify. That's okay. Yes. Appreciate that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a map. So this is just giving an example of how the PARE could be used in an analysis. So this is just a map showing, um, for this example, the Franconia district. So it has all of the parks mapped on top of the PARE. So you can see you know, how the block groups are situated, where the very low uh, block groups are, all the way up to very high. You know, So staff could use this just in a visual way to be able to see what what do the, what are the different parks near those very high and high uh, block groups are? And this is just the same the same map, but using opportunity areas. So just highlighting the opportunity areas within Franconia District. So you can see again, you know, the hash marks are those that are highlighted within the PARE that are not highlighted um, in the current vulnerability index. From a from a a, a racial perspective is the is the last one we just saw the, the the one before that was socioeconomic and this is this one is strictly no this is the same so the kind of that cream color to blue is showing all five categories okay. so you can see very low low average and you can see all that in this map all you're seeing all that's being highlighted is the opportunity areas which is the high and very high so it's just calling out the opportunity areas versus seeing the very low and the low in there the, as well. The, I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions. That was fine. The, the very high, very high what? On the uh, oh, vulnerability okay. spectrum. So it all is broken down into the five categories. So very low would be, you know, you have a high median household income. If you look at those vulnerabilities. Okay, so it's, it's everything. Yes. And, and yes. It's all into a single score. So there's the nine indicators, the eight from the vulnerability index and population of color. Give you one score. And then that one score is broken down into five categories. So if you have a right, low this score, map we're looking at right now is the combined everything. Yeah. Is, and yes. the previous is just socioeconomic. No, it's still combined. It's just showing, it's just seeing five categories. Opportunity, opportunity areas means very high or high. Yes. Okay. So you've got that. Oh, that, so that's just those two things combined yes, as well. Correct. All right. Yes. See, that's so simple. <laughs> well, what I'm going to ask related to all this yes. is my memory's garbage, and this is new for everyone. <laughs> Can you come up <laughs> with a nip, like a one pager that you could, has the key points in this? Because next time I look at this map, 
I'm going to be with I'm not going to remember what the hashes are. Yeah. Well, they mean different things at different places, actually. Yeah. One page cheat sheet. Yeah. And, and the and hashes what? may, I mean, that was simply for this reason to understand the changes between the vulnerability index, because the vulnerability index has been used in the past. So what may have been an opportunity area or not an opportunity area previously may be one now. So it was just that. So for simplification, I can just have opportunity areas and just have those highlighted, get rid of the hash marks. So well, no, I, I, it was helpful to understand the distinction. Yeah, between, yeah. I think but you're added, yeah. but yeah. you added new variables into it. Right. Yes. And this shows the difference between them. But my question, it deals with, I assume it's probably a future iteration of this product. And that is that a, this seems to assume that a park is a park is a park is a park. And that's really not true. Well, that's what the analysis. No, 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 what I'm saying is that right now, this what this what this appears to me to look like is yes, we have a park there, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say, oh, in the Route One corridor, we need facilities for kids to go play sports and playgrounds, even though we have a big piece of open property. Somebody, in other words, right now, this seems to me to treat it as a parks and parks and parks. Yeah, this this is as no, this is absent completely of yeah. parks. Really, this is completely absent of anything happening. Katie's job has nothing to do with parks. This is just data. So now we add in whatever your question is, Katie's data provides the how we're analyzing the parks. Prosa is going to be looking at the types of parks, where parks are, what our needs are, individual. This is just a layer that we're going to be using to make informed decision. We can use the same layer to, to decide, you know, I was joking around with Kyle earlier, is are we going to um, concert series, right? We're not going to have a whole bunch of potentially, because maybe they they, they are into country's banjo banjos, country's banjos music, music in this neighborhood of high, you know, um, South Asian population. It tells me what the population is so it can tailor stuff towards, yeah. you know, that it's not always giving or taking. It's sometimes there's it's, yes. Population, there's, there are certain communities that are more likely to use a rectangular field than a diamond. Correct. For any variety of reasons. Correct. And, but this is, this is simply a how to do an over this is simply how to put an overlay over the county mm -hmm. that then there's a different that there's a the different iteration of analysis that yes. then says and here's the kinds of things yes katie is the computer you input her into her what your question is we were looking at rectangular fields tell me you know with the data Certainly yes never call a person that but she is <laughs> she's a she's a you know <laughs> but I, but calculator I yes yes but, but they're and she's got a lovely personality. Between, <laughs> it's the future of AI. I know. Um, it's true. Chat GI. Speaker. Too. Uh, <laughs> okay, Katie. Okay, keep going. I I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this seems to. Um, this is all great information, but it, it seems to presuppose that all people of color live in the same neighborhood. That's what I'm getting from it. That there, uh, the, where you have the the white neighborhoods, and then you have the people of color neighborhoods, and all the uh, not all black people live in the same neighborhood. Hash mark, hash mark. <laughs> you know, I, that just doesn't sit well with me. No, it identifies. Oh, can somebody, with... please talk to me because <laughs> I don't live in a hash mark. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know, I know many people, many people who live in what you would call a white neighborhood. So how do you make all that work? So this is this is about um, concentrations of populations. This is not, again, this is not telling us, how do I describe, without the question and the analysis, this is the, the I'm trying to, to think of how I'm describing it, not, not be a science nerd. Um, be a science nerd. Is science science nerd. I could be a science So, yeah, so um, this is the this is portion a portion of the results part of the of the paper, right? This is the data. This is completely useless on its own. This is not a thing that Katie leaves out to the cosmos and lets anybody pick up and like throw things on and then think think that they understand what they're they're talking about. This is the methodology by which we get to a to an answer. There are so many things that go into um, um, go into determining 
where we're where where we're going and what we're doing and the idea isn't if you don't live in one of these blocks and you happen to be you know south asian then you know we're not going to provide cricket facilities for you because you just don't happen to live someplace where you happen to have a whole bunch of you know neighbors who don't look like you um it's 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 a cumulative approach but when we're looking at the density of air, of areas we need to know what the population density within these areas are what they look like and what their vulnerabilities, if there are any, are. And so this is highlighting when we say things like, okay, where do we want to focus X or Y or Z? It gives us a starting point that definitely needs a further triaging down to get to the answer. Oh, okay, yes. thank you. Well, yes. I, I will tell you, thank you. What's gonna help me uh, to understand this better is, can Katie, can anyone show me where Tiny Run neighborhood area is Franconia district is my district. I'm trying to see where is Piney Run area. Is that broken out on here at all? Because that get, that will give me a real good understanding. Uh, let me look it up. Of where be um how everything fits together. You guys want to go to the next question? Let me look up let me look up her. Yeah. Thing. Um well at be, some at okay. some point and I, what I'm about to ask is not a, can you get this done tomorrow? But is more of a, I assume we're heading towards a, this point <clears throat> would be that there would, this would all sit on top of either through GIS or Google Maps, Google Earth, whatever, some mechanism that would have all of the data on it so you can zoom in and out. Oh, and that, that there would be additional, that over time, we just keep adding layers of, analysis into said thing as mm -hmm. we look at more and more stuff over time because we can't be perfect right. the moment we go we're not able to put everything in is that right yes and this could be published and in fact the vulnerability index is already out right. there so you could and same okay. thing it can be published you can click on any of the block groups and you can see okay this is what the median household income is of the block group this is you know limited speaking english right but you know, like yeah. everything is but what that. I'm suggesting is that I totally understand what you're saying. I think, but that said, what I'm suggesting is if it's sitting on top of a Google Earth equivalent, right, whether it's GIS, what, whatever, the a, a Google Map or whatever, where you can zoom in, but you see the part, not just oh, I can click and see all the data on the census group, but when I go in, I can find a specific park. So, like when Doctor Car Doctor Carter could go zoom in as deeply as she wanted to and find whatever park she wanted anywhere in Franklin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kingstown Park, for example. Right. <laughs> you'd, you'd, be able to zoom, you'd be able to zoom in and see. But I, I assume that that'll be in some future iteration. I mean, that could a year, be... whatever. Yes. Is that, is that, I, it's here. Yeah, and, and, and I don't necessarily want to hold up the, the meeting for that right now. You can get back to me on that later. Um, but um, I, I I think there are some anomalies, of course, and I'm just trying to understand that. Is that Piney Run that you're circling there? Dr. No? Carter, um, uh, Allison's circling. That's Kingstown Park to give you a, a reference. Okay, good. That's Kingstown That's Park. Only... Meadows is... Okay, go ahead. Huntley Meadows is obviously the large green, and then um, that the boxed right just north east, um, west would be that's where your opportunity areas start. Yeah. Okay, good because because there are million dollar homes, eight hundred thousand to million dollar homes surrounding that Kingstown Park, right. and you know what kind of you know I'm just saying. <laughs> and that's kind of yeah. shown out here because it's not an area that's okay. considered an opportunity area. Right. Exactly. But it's close to an opportunity area. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to, and we don't have to go back to it, but when we go right. to the, <clears throat> what Katie is, is, is parsing out is exactly. the high and very high. So what you'll uh -huh. see, that's going to be sort of our pare mm -hmm. opportunity area. But mm -hmm. if you go back or if you go back to a cup, the, go back to one of the ones with all this one, uh -huh. they're all counted. So you can see um around that Kingstown you know park has a very as a low um racial equity index description it's mm -hmm. the lightest blue the okay. only thing that's hot that's that's yes. less vulnerable would be white gotcha. so they have very low low and average uh -huh. but we have cut them out when we're talking because we're focusing on the high and very high that doesn't mean that we don't know we, we the data works both ways mm -hmm. 
Okay. So thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Carter. I apologize. No, just say thank you. Um, when we say something is an opportunity area, <clears throat> that's based on hey, this census block is hashed, right? But th there's no analysis that says, oh, it's a completely dense all townhouses. I mean, you say it's an opportunity area. We're not taking into account there's actually a piece of property there we could do anything with, right? It's absent. It's it is silent right. on that. It's no, just so telling just, you the I'm population. Saying, yes. One of the things that strikes me in this that we have to be careful with mm -hmm. is saying out into the universe, this is an opportunity area when there may or may not be property there for us to actually do something. It's not, it's 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 silent on parks. It's completely silent on that. It it is it's it, there's nothing that we can do with these data by itself. It's completely useless except for your really hard work. Without, with, without, <laughs> right. take that personally, that's just the science right. person. Yes, the rest of the thing is great. It's a layer. It's 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 uh, it's not it's useless without the right. the the question and the exercise. So your question of where should we look at places to put X? That's we would use. We would put it into the tool, and that would be one factor we would look into. So it is it is completely there's nothing to use it with on its own yeah it's just for the three people for the and I, for the 50 people three people whatever that are watching now and the 450 that may watch it yeah. over the next week or whatever i'm just saying that this really I mean, this you've explained that this is just data there is no oh we can actually there's actually something there we can do and there's a project that makes sense and we have an opportunity to do something it's yet. one it's a tool when we're looking at it amongst about a, a, a 12 other things that when we talk about prosa gets layered on population density access to parks the type of parks opportunity areas active social contemplative trailheads there's a lot of things that that fit into that first and the par a analysis right yeah it's just okay. and i yeah. guess i'm getting partially thrown off by the fact that it's the park authority racial equity and it it, it almost it, it's this is but this is just the beginning it it is but without any park data yet i mean it's just it's the it's what it's what's the most useful and as i um was talking to kyle earlier um different agencies should be layering on different things to fit their needs schools should be looking at you know taking that baseline of opportunity their the county's baseline and adding in things like free and reduced kids on free and reduced lunch um, DFS should be looking at, you know, people who have SNAP benefits. There are a lot of other data that should be added on depending on where you're trying to, to, to focus the attention. Okay. Yes. And, and I'll let it cross the street here. I, I'm just, what I'm, what I'm just thinking is we, I think what was throwing me off is we, it was the Park Authority Racial Equity Index. <clears throat> and I, I, in my head was thinking at first opportunity meant there's something we can do there, but we're not there yet. No, it, the, that, that's what was the opportunity area was the nomenclature that was used across my, my the street. I don't. Down yes, a path that was clearly we're continuing to use it. Yes, sorry, my yes. Your point is good. The the word opportunity is is not a good description of what this is. It's more need or needs something like that because opportunity implies that there's an opportunity. Right. Or us, we've inherited opportunity areas. So we're trying to use the same nomenclature. That, that's that was original. But yes, need is a more accurate kind of description title. Uh, okay. I'm not and saying you need to switch to it, but I, I can know that need is the because it, it's sort of getting to Dr. Carter's point. The point yeah, isn't to, to that if if it's dark, it means something bad, or we have to do something. It might just mean it might just tell me something like maybe not banjos, maybe we want to have, you know, a South Asian um, thing. Maybe we want to look at soccer a little bit more than we're looking at baseball. Maybe we want to, you know, when we're looking for places to put a cricket field, we want to, you know, parse through the data and put it here. It doesn't necessarily always mean vulnerable. It just gives me more tools in my toolbox to make a decision in what goes in what area. Or it's super dense. And therefore some of the mobile ideas we've talked sure. about. Sure. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. There. Yes. There's, there's different yes. Yeah. Which um trans tr what 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 uh, languages should we translate? You know, flyers for an activation in this area. This will tell me what the the population density is, and you might not you might you know want to translate it in different. You know, it's not one thing. Mm -hmm. Just not it's not English and Spanish everywhere. It's just it's another tool in the toolbox to get you know deeper. Great. Not just where a pickle court should go. Correct. Answer. Correct. Let's understand. Uh, Doc, Dr. Carter said something. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what she said. Oh, I said not just where a pickleball court should go. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> or a dog park, or a or right. anything. We, we just we try to figure it out. 
Okay, right. Let's, let's, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. One uh, more. It's hard to compete with this group in terms of the floor. Yes. Um, just, you just, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Following up on something Jay said, she used the, the term triage. And when we look at these maps, uh, you'll see the, uh, I'll use the opportunity areas, the high, high opportunity areas here, and they're pretty substantial in terms of their numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, uh, what the next map does is it triages mm -hmm. to add to the, the category socioeconomic factors. So that then sets the stage if we were trying to deal in ethnic communities, black communities, and uh, target um, the, the low income that maybe have the least accessibility that that triages are focused down to perhaps the priorities. And we know that we're not gonna have a ton of money, if, if any money, uh, which is going to force us at some point in time to narrow our opportunity search mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the populations. Thank you, Mr. Good Chairman. Good point, good point. Uh, see what you did, Katie? <laughs> no, I... <laughs> I want to underline, though, this this is an introduction. This is step right. one, right? Yes. And we will be hearing more yes, it is. based on this input yes. and based on the questions. Yes, in a month, you'll hear from PROSA. Hopefully in the future, there'll be more you know, analysis that's done that will reference back to the PARA. So we can so we'll kind of know. Yeah, you'll know what the PARA is and what the intention is mm -hmm. when you know, products come forward. We will provide a cheat sheet for you yes. to have in front of you during the process so that we can, yes, yes. the one cheater. Yes, we will. And can we also start an acronym library sheet? <laughs> um, we have that from accreditation if you'd like. Can you pass around to accredited, you're, you're officially approved. <laughs> Which means that you can have a solution for Linwood and Umbridge. <laughs> Sarah, like this board walked directly into the point. <laughs> you're not going to beat Sarah. <laughs> I think. Uh, do we, do we miss anything? Can we? No, the only additional thing I had was a more zoomed in map, but we went through okay. you know, opportunity areas and the other. So we're good. We will be hearing more and more yes. as we tie this together, which will answer a number of our questions. Yes. Yeah, that's what I said. I think okay. it was a right. very good uh, um, program, you know, that you did, and you did a very good job doing it. And Sorry for so many questions. It wasn't. It was not that. It was not. It was not the delivery or the product. It's just we're all trying <laughs> to get our little. head wrapped around. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's part of it too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll get back to you on um, the uh, detail of that uh, southern roast. So thank thank you. you. You've done a great job. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, okay, item number two. Thank you. Um, that is um, um, me, sure. Chairman. Um, I will go fast and make up some time. Um, this is an information item about um, the Fairfax County Sports Tourism I, um, RFI. Uh, next slide. So um, just a little bit of the background. We are embarking on a request for interest, an RFI, to identify potential partners with the ability to develop, permit, construct, implement, manage, operate, and market a multi-sports complex in furtherance of the county's economic development goals. You'll remember we did the sports tourism um, report, and this is an RFI to solicit um, proposals. Next slide. I'm just going to go through a little bit of a time frame, uh, timeline. We talked about it a little while ago. Um, the study was complete in summer 2020. Um, the task force shared that um, report with the Board of Supervisors. In fall of 2021, the task force had a discussing a discussion regarding the governance structure. Winter of 2021, the task force discussed next steps, um, and that included a RFI. In spring 2022, the task force requested a motion to advertise at the BOS. The task force requested a motion to advertise a pub for a public-private partnership opportunity by RFI. Um, at that BOS um, meeting in spring of 2022, um, the chairman and um, a few other um, 
uh, board members had a discussion about equity, um, this is equality, but equity review, about equity and wanted us to come back and do an equity review on the proposal for an RFI. We did that and went back to the, um, the BOS winter of 2022. Um, and at that time, the BOS requested that FCPA move forward on an RF, RFP, an RFI, they wanted to be clear to see the scope um, of the RFI. They wanted us to focus solely on FCPA sites um, for that RFI, and that's what we're bringing um, bringing to you today. So after this, we will then um, provide a NIP to the BOS on the information and the RFI, and that will be then um, out on the street. Uh, next slide. So this is the summary. Um, we're again we're seeking interest in private and or nonprofit entities for public private partnership to explore the creation and operation of a multi sports complex on an undeveloped FCPA owned property for the purpose of sports tourism and the ability to host tournament play. Um, there are four potential sites located, um, uh, Mountain Road Park, Halifax Point Park, um, Rock Hill Park, all three of them in the Sully District, and Patriot Park East in the Springfield District. Um, the RFI package includes proposed activation acti activities and operations plan, management experience, financial ability to implement, and what the budget would be through the first year. Next slide. These are the potential sites. Um, uh, Mountain Road, if you're not familiar, and Rock Hill are um, uh, right next to each other. Um, Halifax Point also on the western side in Sully and Patriot East. Next slide. All right, so um, um, what's next? Let me go back, go back. I think I didn't highlight the point. Um, we made it very clear that we were looking at unrealized um, parks with current master plans that have multi-sports um, fields on them um, so that this process does not have us having to um, update or redo a master plan. Um, it's not a, um, we did not target Sully, just that that's where the large parks are with multiple um, potential, that's that's master plan for multiple fields, including mm -hmm. um, Patriot. So that's where it got narrowed down to, um, to field uh, parks that already were master plan for multi-fields. Next slide. All right, as far as time time frame, we are at the um, um, we did the board of supervisors. Um, well, BOS review is happening right after this meeting. We'll be sending the NIP April slash May, so we're right on time. Um, <clears throat> the, the RFI would then be advertised summer of 2023, and hope to receive responses fall of 2023 and possible presentation of interest did entity to the park authority board if we got get any solicitations um winter of 2023 next slide i think that that's that's it questions questions well i'll start um when i read the executive summary of of uh, this report uh it talks about um, an assumption of uh, general obligation bonds being issued and uh um and with a 90 percent uh public and a 10 percent uh, private participation rate it's assuming an interest rate of uh, interest of about three something million million dollars which i uh, assume at the assumed interest rate to be about a 75 million dollar bond and my question is even if they're not well a are they our bonds uh or are they county bonds but even if they're county bonds that's tapping into a cash flow that the county with which the county is already stretched, and um, uh, so it's another mouth feeding at the at the trough of the the county bond cash. <coughs> executive cash summary flow. of the sports reports for charts. Okay, so I want to make it clear that was done, and Patriot North was included in that report, and so that is not. Um, and correct me when I'm sorry. That was the bonds that we're talking. We we. We built Patriot North. Okay. Right. So th this RFI is not assuming any county bond dollars in. This RFP is providing the land and expecting somebody to come in to, to provide all of the rest. There's okay. no, that's the whole, this, okay. there's no solicitation. Such a clarification. Well, Thank you very much. I also much. recognize that the Sports Tourism Task Force, which I've been on since the beginning of it, um, walked in looking at all options. And so the consultant looks at lots of different options. I don't think anybody sitting around that room thought the $110 million county should go build an indoor sportsplex 
mm-hmm. was the the with with county money <clears throat> was the direction to go. Um, so I know in the hundred and eighty pages or whatever the report mm-hmm. it discusses a variety of options, including a variety of properties that aren't necessarily on the, on this. Um, but we've I, I would just know that and we talked about this a little bit briefly, but we've gone through this a little bit before. And part of what we're trying to determine is what the level of interest is. Um, some of us recall that way back when with a piece of property that we still have not had turned over to us by the school system. So if they ever watch this, we're so upset about that. I want to run. Um, the, I the, just get through. The, um, Three we did an RFI way back then about an indoor track facility mm-hmm. and had no responses. And that was part of showing folks that doing outside financing of it was just not an option. Um, the consultant thinks that there are some potential options here. This helps explore. This helps us go through the process of exploring what those could be. It doesn't obligate us to. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. That said, no other questions. We will. Uh, no, that's it. That's it huh? um, oh, I thought you had a question. <laughs> 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 Uh, I mean, well, I, I'm sorry. There, there um, wasn't there an action item on the board agenda to move this forward or not? It was a, it was a, um, just an information. It's a clerical error. error. It, the information yeah. on the agenda. It's an information item. It's not a consent. Okay. Yes, yeah, yes. So. yes. That's what yes. I tried to okay. explain. Yeah. yeah, I knew you had mentioned it, but with respect to the committee. So, okay, thank you. Okay, the uh, <clears throat> planning and development committee is hereby adjourned. Okay, the resource management committee is uh, in session and I hope you all can talk real fast because I'm getting hungry. So <laughs> come on up. Who's going first? I'll go first. John? Yes, please. Okay. We're fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Nice to be talking with you all in person. Uh, I think last time we spoke was for annual presentation. We'll be talking about the finding where we talked about the findings from the Western Area Natural Resources Management Plan. Um, today we come to you um, with a request uh, to proceed on two of our final natural resource man- regional natural resource management plans, Central and the Southeastern. Just a little background here, um, and so what for why we're doing these. Um, basically, these are guided by our uh, overarching na- natural resource management plan for Park Authority, which provides guidance guidance recommendations for the actions of of the natural resources branch and uh, it incorporates elements of both regional other regional natural resources management plans as well as uh, site-specific natural resource management plans um, to both um, provide direction for our group but also if you remember when I talked to you last time we talked about the tenants of my program and that inventory that knowing what we have that's what this accomplishes and knows it informs us how much what quality and where some of our highest quality natural resources are on parkland so this is how we've broken up the uh, the county, 25,000 acres broken up approximately on watershed bounds or boundaries, excuse me. Uh, we completed the western area there in 2021. We're almost done with the northern area and we'll be uh, t- taking on the central and southeastern area as we move forward. Um, again, we've completed these two sections here, or rather we're, um, we're working on completing the northern area now. We just received our final report for rare wildlife from the state who we contract out with uh, to do some of that inventory work for us and um, our uh, plant ecologists have completed their surveys uh, for this area. So we are um, in the writing stages, essentially. Um, as you saw with my presentation for our annual report, I reported out on the Western Area Regional Natural Resources Management Plan. We talked about all the great findings from that um, and it has since provided um, direction for uh, where we're taking the branch, uh, specifically when it comes to restoration, as well as protection and maintenance for those rare resources and then the completed restorations in that area. Uh, You heard me mention uh, vegetation ecologists. Uh, Mapping um, natural communities is a huge part of the regional natural resource management plans, uh, similar to how we just talked about uh, mapping uh, uh, social and racial aspects of Fairfax County. We're essentially the same thing, but we're doing it with natural resources. So it tells us what we have and allows us as natural resource managers to basically best serve those communities, whether that be through protection, restoration, 
uh, or various other maintenance activities, um, avoidance in some cases as well. So this is uh, just a small snapshot of what that product looks like. Um, it's very granular. It's at a higher uh, uh, granularity level than even the state provides in many cases. Um, so not only are we providing uh, the residents of Fairfax County and ourselves uh, with high quality data, but uh, we're also um, providing a, a higher level of granularity to the state as well when it comes to our natural communities. So typically I come to you uh, with a request to fund one of these initiatives. Today I come to you with two and there's good, yes. Just a quick clarification on nomenclature. On this map, on the first, first time it was shown, the, the red was called Eastern. Is Southeastern any different from Eastern or are they the same thing? Uh, it's basically, yeah, the, the it's Southeastern is what it should be there. So it's that red part there. <laughs> because um, many of these encompass eastern portions of the county or southern portions of the county, so southeastern. <clears throat> the reason we're packaging two here is because uh, the, the realities of working in the field and bringing on uh, veg ecologists or retaining veg ecologists who may be completing a field season uh, uh, in one of these regions, but have additional, basically extra time or extra need to carry over those activities within that same field season. Uh, into the, in this case, the southeastern section. So essentially folks will be beginning their resource inventory work in one area and then yeah, proceeding to the next area without having to wait an additional year to get that funding. That's also uh, the case with our uh, contracted out biologists with the state who are doing our, our rare wildlife inventories for us. Here you can see the um, central area. Uh, and this is gonna be the larger of the two with many large stream valley parks that will be assessing uh, seven, 1,700 acres, and then the southeastern area, uh, we anticipate this uh, taking quite a bit less time. Uh, we also have many important resource parks in this area, like Huntley Meadows and Laurel Hill, which uh, have some assessment that's been done, but we'll be looking at those areas uh, again as uh, it's been some time for, for some of that work that's uh, to have been done. So um, 3,600 acres here. Uh, with that, I will take any questions. Questions? That's good. All right. Um, wow. Consensus to move this forward? Yes. yes. All right. Very yes. good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. That was Especially really fast. Yes. Thank I tried to put my auction here. All right. Good thing. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, Hi, hello again. I want you to come on over and speak to us here. All right. Thanks. Uh, nice to see you all again. Um, I'm Owen Williams. Um, how do I get to the other? Uh, oh, great. Thanks. I'm Owen Williams. I'm the uh, I work uh, under John's supervision in the Natural Resources Branch. I'm the program manager for the Ecological Restoration Program, and I'm here to propose um, funding for three forest restoration projects uh, at Oakmar, Mason District, and Huntley Meadows Park. <clears throat> uh, the reason we're proposing these three projects at the same time is that they have similar problems, similar goals, and similar solutions. Well. We suspect they're going to have similar solutions. We haven't worked them all out yet. But uh, the three photos there, the top is from Oakmar, the middle photo is from Huntley Meadows, and the bottom is from Mason District. And um, as you can see, there's really not a whole lot of forest to speak of in these particular project areas. And so that's one of the goals is to reestablish a forest canopy in these places. And then uh, with that as the architecture for a forest, uh, you can allow the other pieces of the forest, the other layers, the wildlife to come back in underneath. Um, so uh, so that represents the goals and likely we'll, we'll be using similar methods in all three projects. So it gives us um, an opportunity to really learn from each project and to contribute to each other. And it gives us some efficiencies uh, in terms of project management and administration. Um, so the first, first project is Oakmar. Uh, the, the uh, colorful map on the right is that same product that John was just talking about, the natural vegetation community classification data set. And um, we're able to use that now as we get this data to identify restoration opportunities. And uh, the, the colors in that photo or in that map, the darker green is the healthier forest area. Um, the lighter green is, is sort of like a B rating, yellow is C and, and red is the least healthy locations. So, um, part of that data collection involves giving it a community quality ranking, and then we can color that on the map. So, so we can identify this red area as an opportunity for restoration where it's least healthy. Um, and that not only gives us an opportunity to restore a forest area, but then also to uh, improve the conditions that are adjacent to a healthy forest area, which contributes to protecting the health of that area as well. 
Um, so that's the location at Oakmar. And um, I just circled the primary project focus area there. Um, one of the great things about this project is immediately adjacent to Flint Hill School and also the Oakmar Rec Center. Um, we actually have a contact at Flint Hill who's an avid birder and we know him from his attention and, and time that he spent in other parks of ours. He's actually an environmental science teacher. So we're looking forward to um, potentially working with him and some of his classes to um, collect data and, and assist us with invasive plant uh, removal and things like that. Um, so, so that's a great opportunity there uh, to engage the community. And um, so the project area is about eight and a half acres in size, and it's a mix of sort of upland and wetland forest. Um, before you go on, is the eight and a half acres the entire red area or no? Um, it's it's sort of approximately within that black circle. circle okay. Yeah. Okay. And that that eight and a half acres is is the is the proposal, but once we get into the work, we may find that we can expand, expand or, or may have to contract depending on what okay. needs to be done. <clears throat> Here's some photos from on the ground there at Oakmar. Uh, the photo on the left is um, a non-native invasive wisteria vine that, as you can see, is preventing any forest from growing there and is actually kind of hauling down mature trees from around the edges of the opening and, and expanding the size of that opening. Those, if, if you walk through the forest on the outside of this, this opening, you, you, it's like having a million trip wires on the ground and, and you, oh, yeah. you end up falling down. Um, so, so the canopy there has completely failed and we need to reestablish that architecture. Uh, and then, and then there's a stand of bamboo there as well, which is, stands out nicely in the wintertime. And this, this photo on the left is the view standing on Germantown Road <laughs> looking into what was, um, and the school is immediately to the left of that, of that image. <clears throat> uh, the next park is Mason District Park. Uh, there's a image there, the master plan that was amended in 2001 most recently. Uh, we don't have the NVCC data from this park yet, but we're working on that. And um, there did used to be an IMA site at one of the project locations here, and there was a stream restoration from DPWS. Uh, so there's been a lot of attention to this park for its various different natural resources. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to, to hone in on some of those terrestrial forests. Um, this project is broken into two smaller project areas, the, uh, the larger of which is about three acres where the old IMA site was. And then the um, the second project or the project area labeled number one on the map uh, is there was a um, some type of oak mortality event there where all of it was a chestnut oak forest mm. and something happened and all the chestnut oaks died. So um, uh, I'll show you in this next photo uh, on the right there. That's where that happened. And those trees that are circled in red uh, experienced that mortality event. And so you sort of have the skeleton of this forest standing up there with, with no leaves up in the top and all that sunlight coming down onto the forest floor um, and uh, invasive trees are starting to grow up underneath where normally you might have uh, regenerating chestnut oaks or other species that go along with them. So uh, part of this project is gonna be figuring out what that mortality event was, uh, whether it can be prevented, um, you know, whether we can do anything at all given that, that those are the conditions there um, so that'll be part of the project. And, and it's a great opportunity for us to work with the Urban Forest Management Division as well, um, because they, they may be able to help, help us with tissue samples to do some diagnostics. Uh, the photo on the left is that other project area where the old IMA site was. And uh, that's a big forest opening where, as you can see, for years, the forest has not been able to regenerate uh, through a combination of invasive plants and overabundance of deer, deer herbivory. And then the third project area is at Huntley Meadows. Um, you guys are more than familiar with this park. Um, the big restoration at the Central Wetland was in 2014. We've done some additional small scale wetland restoration projects there uh, that were installed uh, last fall. Um, they, they depend on precipitation, which we didn't have a whole lot of this winter. So we, we haven't really seen a whole lot of results from those yet, but we're hoping that in the future we will. Um, so lots going on at Huntley Meadows. These are photos from the project areas at Huntley Meadows. Um, it's kind of a nightmare landscape of porcelain berry vines, which have just similar to what happened at Oakmar with the wisterias. They just covered everything. And those little mounds and pillows that you can see, those, those are the shapes of former trees and stumps and things like that. And it's doing the same thing here. It's sort of yanking down trees from around the edges of this opening and preventing anything from growing. Um, on the right is a stand of calorie pear which is a monoculture 
in that location and uh, is another another source of um, you know problem for for the forest that would need to be addressed. Uh, these are the two project areas at Huntley Meadows broken into sections. The the lower project area there, number two, was where those photos are from. And uh, there may actually be larger areas there that can be treated. Um, and we may have a potential partnership in WD DPWES in that location. And then the upper, the upper section, project area number one, is right along that very popular hike bike trail at, at the park where uh, we've been working with staff to determine that this would be a great opportunity. Uh, opportunity for uh, nature education and programming to talk about restoration, talk about ecology, wildlife. So, so that that's a really highly visible project area. <clears throat> that's the area three maintenance shop, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, the shop is actually right there in that in that outset photo. So total acreage at Huntley Meadows is almost nine acres as, as part of the plan. So again, um, these three projects coming together common objectives, um, common processes. Uh, we're gonna investigate the threats that we've got at each location, which as you know, in this area tend to be related to invasive plants and overabundance of deer. In this case, we've also got um, some type of oak mortality event that happened. Um, and then part of our process uh, going forward, we to design the treatments and the schedule that we'll use. Um, the NVCC data, those colorful maps, identify really specific types of forests and, and plant communities, and we'll be doing that to create our target forest community. What is our, you know, our blueprint going to be for these restorations? It'll tell us exactly what plants will be growing there. It'll tell us, you know, how the water should be moving through there, what the what the soils are like. And so we'll really hone in on that during the design process, um, uh, and then uh, determine our methods for controlling invasive plants and how we need to protect uh, the, the place from deer for, for regeneration of forest. Um, and, and so the goal for, for all three of these essentially is to establish that next cohort of trees that will become the future canopy um, for, for each of these project areas. Here's some photos. I just thought these would be um, helpful for getting an idea of what this is gonna look like between kind of the end of the project, you know, this sort of five-year installation phase Sort of between the, the end of that and 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 sometime in the future when we could call this a really truly healthy forest, which might be 80 years in the future when you know our you know grandchildren will be uh, enjoying that. Um, and so we might see things like tree twos where things have been planted. That's that's from Elk Lake Preserve. The photo in the upper right is from Frying Pan, the forest restoration there, where we've got seedlings growing on the ground now. And uh, the lower photo is also from Outlook Preserve, which is our oldest forest restoration project. It started in 2017, um, where we we have a sort of thin canopy of trees uh, kind of sheltering the seedlings that are underneath. Um, so that, that's sort of possibly what it might look like in between. And then I, ideally, we're going to wind up in this kind of a condition where we've got all kinds of layers in the forest, a canopy, a midsection, and then something on the forest floor where the where we can see seedlings that are ready to take the place of older trees when they when they pass on. Um, so that's kind of like the ideal setting in in the you know a couple of decades from now. And that's everything I've got. There you go. Thank you, everyone. Yes, yes, Ken. Just one question, uh, and you probably have the answer to this quick. Are there future projects on the list that um, like other ideas for well, other parks, for example, you have you have three here. I just wondered if there are more that uh, you have scoped out that uh, might be on the list coming. Or yes, definitely, we have a good list. Good list. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> big list. Big list. Okay, thank you. I think I can speak for them that we could spend our entire CIP on their list um, with all of the 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 needs for our natural areas. Well, these are added. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I'm going to ask a selfish one because I always bother John about this because I want an excuse to have a chestnut in <laughs> in in a park somewhere. Yeah. Now that they've figured out some crossbreeding and genetics, do we? I know you're looking at the community. I suspect the answer is no. But are any of these good candidates for an American chestnut? So typically, that would be a more mountainous mountain community um it would have been one of the dominant canopy species as you probably know um 
Fairfax, maybe not so much in the Piedmont and the coastal plain, although it certainly would have existed here. So those areas probably pushing further west if we were to look for a site for something like that. So something in Sully. Well, the that. Triassic Basin. I, try. I don't know. If we, <laughs> the Triassic Basin and dye based soils and, and stuff you got out there is is unique, certainly. Yes, but it not is. the type of mountain community um, that would, would be typical for, for chestnuts. But just a point of observation there is an American Chestnut Land Trust in Calvert yeah. County on the yeah. Chesapeake Bay yeah. down yeah. south of Prince Frederick. Yeah. So it's round, but might be letting the cat out of the bag, but we did find live American chestnuts at Fred Crabtree. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, Could you please take oh, Kyle there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I need pictures. I need pictures for the director's report and the chairman's report. And if I, you think I'm joking, no, I'll give you a cell phone number. <laughs> and I mean, they do occur. They do co-occur yes. with chestnut oak. So yes. okay. it is something we can think about. Again. Can, can we transplant one to Huntley Meadows? <laughs> well, let's just make sure that you know, we get it taken care of before we cut them down as invasive species and say that they're not supposed to be them. I mean, <laughs> could be. I'm just, uh, if they're not supposed to be, we, but, I mean, we tend to just, I mean, this actually, I think, speaks to, let's be careful that we don't just, just cut down because it's not. If, if it's invasive, therefore get rid of it isn't always the best solution. So we work closely with Urban Forestry Management Division, who helps us with forest pests um, and for uh, basically throughout the county on just general tree work and, and surveys. We utilize a lot of their data for our own inventory work. And I think if we wanted to explore something like that, um, similar to how they're helping us with the spotted lantern fly control, um, emerald ash borer, although that, that boat has to sail, I suppose, um, we would definitely be working with them uh, to, if we were to uh, identify a hybrid that was suitable, make sure that we had the best chance of surviving. So I right, actually getting past whether they don't really dive like five or seven. That would be nice. Um, no, I'm saying we'll indulge it, but yeah, generally speaking, giving them past the the that critical time where they need to escape um, any sort of forest pests that they're suffering from. Um, but I think we can always look for those opportunities. Um, Hemlock, That's definitely good to what did you say, Fred Crabtree. Yeah. 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 There you go. Uh, field trip. Field trip. Field trip. Field trip. Yeah, Amer Eastern Hemlock is another species too that. Um, Obviously, we have a management strategy or control for hemlock woolly belgian, but um, you know there are areas in Fairfax County where we still have old growth hemlock, um, so where we can promote that as well, we're looking forward. Good deal. Okay. Good deal. Thank you for indulging. <laughs> Any other questions? Consensus to move this forward. Yes. All yes. right. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. The uh, Resource Management Committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. I guess I guess I'm technically you are honest. Bill's being insubordinate, so you're on <laughs> you're on deck. So two minutes. I, I call the communications and community engagement committee to order and Faisal has said we have two minutes. We've we got a little bit more. <laughs> do that. Do that. Man, before you get started, I just I'm sure everyone's aware. Did one point this is a new committee um that I think we need. I want to be a less to be a little more intentional with our and engagements generally with understanding what happened um, when we do something like what Ben's piece of this will will cover and, and Jay's going to talk a little bit about uh, trails and sidewalk committee that she went to just so everyone uh, on our board has a better understanding of what's going on and all the, there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things and there's bits and pieces of information that comes back just to improve the flow after something happens but also thinking a little more intentionally proactively um, about engaging stakeholders like the Board of Supervisors, Canada's an interest in maybe being a little more deliberate and reaching out to FCPS, perhaps the Planning Commission gets brought in there too. So that's the idea behind um, behind this committee. So just and we're going to, the, the next item is just a little bit of a conversation. So this is the first item, but then the next one is just to, to get um, wheel spinning about other opportunities that we need to um that we should sort of cement, but also provides the opportunity for us to report back on those. So it's not just we go out there and we have the meetings with EQAC or the other meetings, but there's a there's a fundamental way by which we come back and report on the successes or the conversations had therein. So you have about 30 seconds. 
30 seconds. All right. <laughs> there was a hearing. We were, no. Um, uh, I'm Ben Boxer, the public information officer. I'm very happy to be here to report back to you what happened uh, at the budget hearings uh, that happened not long ago on April 11th, 12th, and 13th. Um, that was the uh, uh, annual public hearing on the advertised FY 2024 budget. Uh, total of 133 speakers uh, over the course of three days. One in five spoke about parks which is a pretty darn good uh, uh, outcome for us. Uh, they spoke in support. We had um, 26 total speakers speaking about parks. Three uh, Park Authority board members uh, presented there. We thank you for your attendance. And uh, Bill Bowie also submitted comments for the record. We had two members of the Park Foundation uh, attend and numerous friends groups, uh, other allied supporters uh, and individual citizens. And I'll also add individual organizations, some of whom changed their uh, or amended their remarks at the microphone, referring back to friends, groups, and people that testified previous to them. So that was very uh, enheartening. And, and we got some, some on the spot agreement with some of the points that were made. Um, some of the hot topics that were addressed in the uh, hearing process uh, included forestry, uh, equity, and uh, that's a big Family of, of topics, uh, the couple of notes I pulled out was equity of access, location, language. Um, mobile nature centers were, were very popular to talk about. Park rangers, waste and recycling, turf fields, capital equipment. And then a lot was brought up about uh, reviewing the revenue model, uh, obtaining more dedicated funding from the general fund to help support park programs. Uh, and in one particular case, uh, for sure, uh, there was mention of the need to support revenue-based salary increases uh, with general funding uh, as well. So um, that is the very high-level overview of uh, what was presented. Thank you. The um, are there any questions about the hearing or what what might have been heard from it? What was the conversation on the guy? Yes, Lake I think uh, we had several discussions. Uh, there were some uh, presentations made about um, uh, just the work that was un underway. Uh, we had one speaker uh, from uh, Save Lake Accenting uh, talking about uh, conditions and and wanting investments made to uh, to uh, I guess restore the uh, the playground, uh, which now I know it's under uh, review in third quarter. Uh, we should hope to hear a resolution from that next week uh, in terms of the funding for that. So in addition to that, we had an environmental, there was an environmental committee yesterday, 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 that Lake Akatink was the the star of the, the conversation. So um, DPWES formally to the full, the, the um, committee of a whole um, went through a presentation and their staff recommendation um, is to was to not dredge the lake, but to look at a uh, alternative wetland option and to um, uh, re-engage in the master planning um, process with, with dedicated funding from the county. The response back from that, they did not vote on that. The response back from that was that Supervisor Walkinshaw proposed to create a task force, of a citizen task force that, that, that he's proposing um, uh, to get together and um, I don't think it's out who the who the members are yet. Um, thank you. Um, and to review the purpose of the task force would be to review the work of DPWES um, because I think a lot of comments that came in um, were talking about transparency and so re review back the work to make sure that their numbers are correct. Check their math. Um, and um, look at what another, the wetland option would look like, because that's still gonna cost money. Um, we make a point of, we don't just wanna leave it and let a wetland um, grow back. It'll become a monoculture mess. Um, there's a, gonna be a little bit of management. So we wanna make sure we factor um, that in. And that's where it stands right now. Is there any um, opportunity to preserve some of the ability to fish and boat is like I could think um it's not the I, 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 it's pardon. not that's not DT, DPW's recommendation that may come out of the task force as Supervisor Walken just coming out and that's what the community <clears throat> ends up requesting but based on the DPWES recommendation there wouldn't it would you know it would become a wetland and over time it would fill in there wouldn't be 
the depth to allow for boating. Yeah, I understand it's a, um, a ton of money, uh, two tons of money uh, to dredge it, put it back in shape. At the same time, um, the, the county isn't going to have any more lakes. Um, and apparently we've used up this lake you know, with our past uh, development practices or whatever. Um, so I think it uh, also may, maybe is closest lake to our opportunity areas in terms of access. Um, so I just, I don't know, I guess maybe this is an opportunity that folks have given up on. Um, I just, uh, it's a, a I guess, think crying I, in the I dark. I think it probably makes sense that the discussion about Lake Akatink itself is probably a broader conversation in a in a different committee rather than the communication piece of this, only because I think there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I mean I, I think I participated in five or six monstrously huge community meetings. We had lots of people. We had that walk around one where we walked around all the stations. We had, you know, the one that was at the at the school cafeteria that was standing room only that had three or four supervisors there. I mean, we've, we've gone through. Um, I think that what's becoming clear is that um, there are concerns about the costs of any, of any solution that tries to preserve the lake itself in some way. Because it's not just one-time cost, but it's recurring and ongoing costs. Yeah. Um, and the only solutions were working up the streams with really expensive stream repair. There were, so there was a lot going on. My bet is that um, we will probably hear, I, and, and this committee is kind of new. So, you know, whatever the chairman throws at us to, to do, we'll do. And, you know, um, but, but I think that we will hear that there are going to be ongoing community meetings. Yes about this that are going to take a while for folks to work through because it's not just a what you want but say what you want and then are you willing to put 100 200 50 million whatever solution the community then comes to there's a cost to and then figure out how to do that so i think that's going to be an ongoing issue for a while the the committee has not task force whatever nomenclature james is using hasn't been publicly announced yet um, so I don't know who's on it. There is a spot reserved for someone from the Park Authority to represent our interests to that community. Because at the end of the day, it's our lake, it's on all, our property. Um, but, but it's not to, necessarily our money. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, I think it is the price tag has exceeded our ability to pay. Right. Um, but Jim, you make a good point. We probably should have even in future environmental committee have DPW come in and update everyone. Like, I know what's going on there, but it probably would be good for the whole board to have a little bit of an update on what the current county staff thinking is. Um, I, I can ask uh, Chris Harrington to come to a future uh, meeting and give the same present. It's a short present. It'll yeah. it'll it a conversation, but it's worth it for you to understand where how how they came to their staff. What we came to our staff, the staff well, recommendation. But, but I would just I I would suggest that when we do that, we probably make sure that. <clears throat> that presentation include a kind of all the steps the park authority has already done all those meet you know, just remind people of the timeline and everything that's been done because this isn't something that was always focused on i think that that um it was something that at different times that cynthia's predecessor cynthia cynthia me and springfield braddock and your predecessor it, it was kind of those three districts tended to bump into it a lot more mm -hmm. We can do a, we can try to do a history. We, we'll do two quick. I, I want, I would like him to come and give the exact same presentation that he gave right. to the BOS and the environmental committee so everybody can understand. We can put together a couple slides with about the, the history to get to, to where we are for the parks mm -hmm. is perspective that would end right at the master plan point that we. Right. Stop. I, I think it's important to remind people of the amount of public engagement yes. that has gone on. Yes. Well, what, I mean, there's been, been several options considered in the past. Not just yes, in, correct. It seems like we're down to two now, but there were several in the middle of those. Correct. Mm -hmm. There's a great um, a storyboard 
that's also online that we can kind of direct everybody to before we have that meeting. So there's going to be, there's plenty of information that's been compiled by uh, staff over the last six months. So we can get that out to everybody as well. Yeah, I just think, I just think that especially knowing that, again, people may look back at the, the it's just giving them a reminder. I just know that in the past, sometimes people haven't realized how much we've engaged with the public on some of our decision making. Mm -hmm. And just reminding them, this is, we, we've had years and years of engagement before the pandemic mm -hmm. on this issue. So. so since we are talking about money management, so was there any conversation or comment on the bond cycle issue that we are facing right now? Um, not, not, not noticeably that I called out in the notes um, that I've reviewed. People have been advocating about that. So I'm just wondering that if there was any traction of that. Yeah, no, no mention of the of the bond cycles any of the testimonies I've reviewed. We are continuing to have conversations about um about that. I'm very hopeful that um, you know, especially with the cash flow issues, they understand sort of the limitations, especially with um trying to get um Audrey more. It's not out of um not out of sight. We're working through that on a regular basis. Yes. Yes, yeah. No, understood. Are there any other questions about the Board of Supervisors hearing and those pieces. All right. I know you had some other items, I believe. That were no, the next one is is exactly what I said before. This is just the um, uh, brainstorming. I just wanted to throw out a few things that, you know, with this committee <clears throat> to report back on and to schedule, um, you know, um, Ken's got an interest um, as the chair of the, um, or as the, the school board liaison. Yeah. Um, to uh, schedule a joint, potentially a joint meeting or some sort of a form, formal um, get together with the um, um, Fairfax County school system. Um, we will be soon scheduling um, the joint uh, meeting with the Board of Supervisors. Um, EQAC has been scheduled. Yes, so definitely. EQAC has been scheduled. Um, as Kyle mentioned, um, I went to speak to the Trail Sidewalks and Bikeways Committee. Um, they did not give me a subject besides trails, sidewalks, and bikeways. So I got to present on Jay's mind on trails. Um, that went really, um, really well. And it, it just talks about sort of how our a lot of our interests align um, and that we can walk and chew gum at the same time just because we're focused on CIP issues does not mean that we're not um, huge trail advocates or, or um, natural resources um, um, uh, folks. We've been talking a lot about um, with various conversations with supervisors about um, making a con uh, conscious effort to get in front of the committees more often with parks related um, um, agenda items. We were on the board for Lake Akatink for the environmental committee uh, yesterday. We were also on the board for Bamboo, which seems like we're never gonna be able to get because it keeps getting deferred because they put it on next to Lake Akatink. Um, but um, uh, there are certain, you know, we were we were um, talked about a lot during the, um, the budget committee. And so that also to make sort of bring bigger awareness to what the um, types of things that we're doing. Am I missing any of the um, um, committees? Um, so, oh, and the Health and Human Services, we're um, gonna be trying to get the committee because the dotted line relationship from us to the county is through um, Chris Leonard and the Health and Human Services um, portion of the um, of the county. So we present there, We that's where we presented um, the equity um, last time is to present PROSA. So we were gonna, you're gonna see it next week and then we're gonna go and we're gonna present PROSA at the um, Health and Human Services if we can get on the agenda um, for that. There's also been an interest from, um, I'm sorry, there's something, um, from Supervisor Faust um, and um, other supervisors to, um, they really liked or um, they really appreciated the individual meetings that you all set up with your supervisors. Um, there's an interest in having those um, in the fall prior to when we're, when we're uh, culminating our budget um, to really get some feedback from them as to what is of interest to them. There's such a gap between when I proposed the budget to this body in October and now, and it seems to, to the Board of Supervisors who's now hearing public testimony from the public who's known what our ask has been since October, oh, yeah, yeah. that it seems like it's 
we're surprised. Well, it's not, ours has been out since October. This is the first time that you're seeing it. So to try to bridge those two um, things together. Or this is the first time they're paying close attention. Correct. Yes, <laughs> but that's that's our job. This is why you're the chairman. I'm saying, I'm just, right. but I can say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I think the other thing that we, that we need to be mindful of is that we have not always be it, been as intentional as we could be with some of our outbound communication. And that probably becomes significantly more important given our earlier conversation. And, and I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to give the acronyms right, but the hashtag map presentation. Sarah's going to help you out. Um, <laughs> but, but um, right. you know, we, we need to, we need to remember that we need to, we can't just, we can't from the outside say, oh, this community wants this. We actually need to engage with said community mm -hmm. and get feedback and work with them and be intentional. And I think that at least in the conversation that Kyle and I had about this committee originally was to think through some of those things as well, to, to, to be somewhat intentional and not just, not just rely on broad swaths of understandings, but if we're going to, if we think, and I, I, I don't know what I'm one of those hashed communities, mm -hmm. if we think there's an opportunity in that community, it shouldn't just be a formula of, oh, it's in the, this area, therefore it needs a quarter acre park and the whatever, blah, blah. We should actually engage with said community and, and figure those pieces out, which I think was the other piece to you'd be thinking about. Are there any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns about said new committee? Keeping in mind that you're what's standing between Maggie and her dinner. <laughs> Hearing none. Definitely not. Oh, wait, then. <laughs> Linwood, were you about to say something? Um, only that going to the bathroom is much more important to me than this room. <laughs> Too much information. With that, guys. with that, I'm going to adjourn and get the microphone turned off. <laughs> <All right. laughs> oh. Okay. Item number one is a resolution to honor Dan Sutherland, manager of park management branch within the park operations division for his 35 years of excellent service. So I do the motion now. I moved. Guess Second. So. <laughs> any, any discussion on this? If we vote no, does it stay? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have to ask Dan that question. <laughs> Make him stand up while we read it. <laughs> we're, getting there. We're, getting there. we're getting there before i start reading it you can sit down then <laughs> whatever never makes you comfortable you make me get up again it's like church <laughs> um we did get a motion though right in a second. a second all right all in favor all right any opposed all right uh, whereas Dan Sutherland has served the Fairfax County Park Authority and residents of the county for 35 years with distinction in various capacities, including as a groundskeeper specialist, park rec specialist, area, man area manager, and park management branch manager within the park operations division. And whereas Dan has played an essential leadership role in creating and improving many maintenance standards and procedures for Fairfax County Park Management, from athletic field and general park maintenance to mowing schedules, snow removal, and serving as a subject matter expert for park improvement projects. And whereas he has contributed extensively to the creation of standards for park equipment and amenities to use limited resources more efficiently, enhance safety within the parks, and establish an equitable park experience across the entire park system. And whereas under Dan's 18 years stewardship of the Mastonbrook Grant Program, he has worked closely with communities, nonprofit organizations, and civic groups to increase the program's number of total projects supported to 209, valued at more than $15.5 million, achieved through an investment of just over $2 million in park bond funds. And whereas, whereas he has been an ex exceptional leader and asset to the Park Authority, 
not only for the significant benefits he has contributed to our facilities and the experience of our visitors through his efforts, but also for his constant mentorship and demonstrations of confidence and trust in the abilities of his staff, leading many of them to agree that his leadership and support have made them better park professionals. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board that it expresses appreciation and thanks to Dan Sutherland for dedicated and outstanding contributions to the Fairfax County Park Authority and residents of Fairfax County. Now you can stand. <laughs> now you have to stand up. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to do it with the flags? Why don't we come over here? Flags. Flags. The floor is now yours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I appreciate this. Thank you very much for uh, everybody's uh, uh, over the years, everything that. Uh, over here, the chair. It's like music and chairs. Uh, anyway, I appreciate everybody's uh, clapping for me and. Uh, you know, thanking me for all my years. I, I, I can definitely say it's been a uh, long 35 years. <laughs> actually, uh, 37, yeah, 36 years, because it went back to 87 when I started as a seasonal in Nottaway. It was a managed park. So uh, a lot of interesting years. Um, you know, the last 20 with the board has definitely had its uh, share of interesting times. Uh, whether it was... Uh, Meeting with dog park groups in the <laughs> Linwoods area and dog park groups in the Bills area. There was a little bit of a theme there with dog park groups, but, um, <laughs> you know, and also I've had some interesting experience with, experiences with board members uh, in the BOS. Uh, I can remember uh, one time having a meeting where uh, we just accepted a piece of property that the board member actually helped us acquire. And uh, Met with them because the the user group for the uh, site uh, did not like some of the things that you know park policy and some of our standards we were trying to apply for uh, scoreboards and such. Well, anyway, interesting comment comment came up from the uh, board member where uh, you know he commented after back and forth with the group. Uh, I did not get this park. A bit, excuse me. I did not get this for the park authority. Just for this property, to become a park. So I, I, I thought that was an interesting comment. And I'll let anybody guess which board member that was. <laughs> he would, you know, you may, you may know him very well. But uh, anyway, you know, Jerry was a good guy, but that was very interesting. <laughs> um, and yes, I was signed up for about a minute before I knew how to react to that one. But anyway, uh, my experiences with board members and with you all have been really good for the most part over the years. I appreciate the support that you all have given me as well as my staff. And I hope that you all know how important it is and how meaningful it is for us to actually receive their support. Because oftentimes, as you all know, we go out there trying to, you know, get compliance with park policy and our standards and all that. So actually having somebody to back us up when we know how to push the envelope is very appreciated. Uh, so thank you very much for that in the years. A um, couple little interesting things. I've been up here for 20 years. Um, you know, I, I do want to give out a shout out to Park Ops as a whole. Uh, yes, I know that's a little bit <laughs> you know, bad. I came from Park Ops, but I think one interesting factoid that I will share that hopefully brings a little light to how good the men and women for Park Operations have been over the years. Uh, so 2004, I started, um, believe it or not, right around that time, between then and now, 20 years, uh, 
we actually had between seasonal and merit 45 plus more positions just in park management. That's 35 ish percent workforce that we've lost in 20 years through cuts, budget times, other things like that. So, I mean, as good as they do now, just imagine how much better they could do with eight people per area. It would yeah. be awesome. Yeah. And uh, so, just a little shout out to them to give them props about how good they do given that amount of shortage and resources they've experienced over the years. So, um, you know, and, and one last thing I do want to share with you all um, a little bit personal, but I'm not doing it and bringing attention to it for myself. But many of you may or may not know. A couple of years I had a stroke a couple of years ago. So, um, and I'm not here to speak about or sympathy for me um, or bring attention necessarily to me for that. But I do want to give a little bit of a PSA, so to speak, about strokes and what causes them. Part of it's blood pressure, yes. And nobody here calls that stroke. Let me just say that, leadership included. <laughs> um, <laughs> through his director. But what can cause it <clears throat> is pressure, stress, mm -hmm. and things like that, obviously, blood pressure. Um, but, you know, I just want to give a little thought to that, even in your own lives, in your own jobs, just be mindful of what stress and pressure from workload and other factors can contribute to you um, mentally, physically, and manifest itself in some ways, in some ways we don't want, like strokes. And I'm very blessed that I'm able to come back as decently as I have. Golf game, really crap now. But you know, <laughs> otherwise, uh, you know, I've, I'm back and I'm appreciative of the fact that I am back. But in all seriousness, look out for each other. We're all kind of a mini family of sorts. And, uh, but only look out for yourself as well. And so just watch how much pressure and stress we can put in each other and allow it to be put on us. Just, and a lot of it's just culture. I mean, this is a great organization that's really achieved. We just, we constantly raise the bar, but unfortunately, because we're constantly raising the bar, um, that just results, you know, uh, organically. You're nobody's fault. It just happens. And I can tell you, I push myself regardless of somebody pushing, raising the bar. So I, I again, I, I don't want to overdo that, but I, I do think it's important because it can affect you and it can affect job performance as well. And you forget things or, or you know, anything like that. Uh, so again, trying to get past that one. Don't want to end on that negative thought. But again, thank you very much. I appreciate all the support over the years and uh, you know, looking forward to, to retirement, <laughs> a little less stress, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I definitely appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Lynn. So, Dan, you uh, you did mention actually a couple things uh, in my magisterial district that we did both. Uh, work on together yeah. i hope it didn't cause your stroke <laughs> <laughs> but i, I please say not directly <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I i do want to say thank you very much for those things over the years that you actually mentioned uh that you did help with you were a calming professional a voice of reason through all that and uh always did a stellar job in my mind i will always you know did my admired your demeanor and your work ethic and the logic you always applied to everything thank you very much See, sir, I can be called. <laughs> Question. <laughs> no, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, just thank you. You've put up with a lot. Some of it from me. Some of it from folks in the outlet. Like, I never would have been able to tell that you, you're a lawyer or you're a professor. <laughs> but no, but but thank you, because you all, uh, folks may not realize that Dan has often been the um, the person to deal with some of the more unique athletic concerns. And that requires a special, a special touch. So thank you. Faisal. Well, thank you, Dan, for your service. And uh, I've seen from big issues to a small issue that's small as like lights not working, he gets the call. And he's always there. 
no matter what you feel. If he's there or not there, he is there. So at the end of the day, throughout the chain of command, his phone rings at some point, at some be it Saturday, Sunday, whatever. And he's always been there for the community. And, and thank you for that. You've done a tremendous job. You role model. Dan? Well, Dan has been the Providence District's go-to guy. I pester him probably more than anybody. <laughs> and as as Faisal said, he always comes through and comes through quickly. Thank you, Dan, for all you all you've done for us. You're welcome, Dan. Administrative item number two, adoption of minutes. Do we have a motion? Yes, I move we adopt the minutes of the March 22 Park Authority Board meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. All right. So I think everyone might see on their original agenda we do have that info or um, action item one, but remember that is now uh, an information item. So we're going down to the new A1, which is um, recommended approval of the project scope to begin work on the central area and southeastern area natural resource management plans. I have a motion. So moved. And a second? Second. second. Oh. Um, I made the motion. I only needed a second. Anyway, um, <laughs> all in favor. I'm learning Robert's rules kind of in real time here, people. Awesome. Uh, we'll fix it. <laughs> yes, so I don't sound quite so incompetent. Uh, <laughs> any, any discussion? Any other discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. All right, the action item number two is the recommended approval of the project scope to plan and implement ecosystem restoration projects at Oakmore Park, Mason District Park, and Huntley Meadows Park. Do I have a second? Second. Oh, I, I do need a motion. So, so move. Move. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Any uh, discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Moving on to chairman's matters. Um, no, we have an information item. I guess I need to make note of that. We do have one information item is request for interest, public private partnerships, opportunity for a multi sports complex. Right. So then moving on to chairman's matters. Just want to thank again, Maggie and Abena for coming out and doing the testimony with us and Bill. Um, providing his in written form. And then also Anita and Laura from the Park Foundation came out and testified as well. They came right after us. So thank all of you for, for doing that. And then again, just thank all of you who had your individual conversation with supervisors. I think we're making actual pretty good headway there. I mean, I know there's been a lot of talk around uh, some third quarter funds, but in conversations that I had with Supervisor Mc Chairman McKay and um, Cynthia and I were in a conversation with Rod, uh, Supervisor Lusk last week. There's really been a lot of recognition of getting those uh, bamboo and forestry requests as part of the baseline budget. Um, you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but fairly optimistic that we might see something a little bit more uh, when the final budget is adopted. And speaking of, May 2nd is when the BOS will mark up the 24 budget. So if you have any last minute uh, arm twisting you can do between now and then if you're a board member, that's yeah, you got a little less than a week to do so. And then May 9th is the actual formal adoption. Uh, we've had a couple great events recently, two weeks ago, week and a half ago. We opened, officially opened Patriot Park North. I'm sure Michael will um, okay. Hmm? Probably Mike. Well, oh, you'll do oh, it too, but sorry. Mike was there. He's MC. There'll be a nice there'll be a nice selfie in her presentation. <laughs> there will be. Mike doesn't there have will a be selfie. now. <laughs> <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> Just, uh, there's a really good event, great turnout. I'll keep my mouth shut on anymore so I don't steal any more of Jay's Thunder. But did want to thank um Mike, obviously be there to MC it. Maggie, Tim, and Ken, thank you guys for coming out. It was a great, great turnout. 
And then just this past Saturday, we had our first Earth Day festival since the pandemic. This was a great event right up until the point when Tim showed up and it started to rain. <laughs> that's right. That's so right. it's <laughs> a true story. He's been banned from all future outdoor meetings. <laughs> Oh, the park story. It was good. We got through part of our, our the speaking portion. We got enough to get the photo op with Chairman McKay holding the proclamation. So it was mostly good, but really good uh, effort by the park staff. That was an incredibly well attended event right up until the point of good rain. Got everybody scattered, but tons of activities for the kids, learning opportunities. I feel like half of the staff uh, was there manning one booth or another. So it was great to see. Great to see everybody coming out on the weekend. And I do wanna, I've got a list of names that I'm gonna read off because I do wanna highlight some individuals who were uh, involved with the core organizing committee of this, starting with Sarah, um, Chris Goldbecker, Dan Grolke, Eric Nielsen, Julie Gurney, Emmanuel Porter, Mary Oline, Luca, how do you say Luca's last name? Julie. 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 All right. Luca Tui, Rosario Bamba, Maria Betancourt Reed, Larry A Laura, Adrian Dolada, Carol McDonald, Tammy Higgs, John Hilson, Britta Stratford, Allison Rankin, Christina Stanton, Linda Crone, Sarah Oberther, Julie Tahan, Dustin Myers, Beth Gallagher, Yasmin Shafik, Margaret Basia, Susan Kalish. Cindy Fortuna, Fortuno, Bobby Longworth, Margaret Thaxon, and Jessica Tadlock. So just want to particularly call out those individuals at the, from my understanding, the heaviest lift, organizing and making sure everything ran smoothly the day of. And then finally, our farmer's markets are getting, uh, getting going. We had Mount Vernon open, that's a week and a half ago now. I got to ring the bell with uh, Ben on Saturday for the Burke Market. And then over the next week or so, the remainder will come. So make sure you guys all go out to those. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jay. We'll Thank you very you much. Very fun selfie. <laughs> I have, we have three minutes. You think I actually got it? So, okay. Um, I'm going to go through them quickly because according to Linwood, I have five minutes or three minutes for to go around. <laughs> Okay, go ahead to the next. Um, so I love that Kim put it, this um, this in here. Um, it highlights the fact that um, all of our maintenance staff can, can't possibly do all that they do without me there bothering them <laughs> and stopping them from actually working. I actually have to convince them of you know the fact that I don't like. Let's just sort of chat. But this is just a visit um, at Burke Lake um, um, for the. Um, Area four, not area four, area four crew. Um, and they, I didn't realize, I'm glad you put it in there. I didn't realize what it is we were building, the gravel um, loop trail. These are some, you know, I can say guys, cause these are the guys in the in the, in the picture. These are some really great um, guys, very dedicated to, to what they're doing. Next slide. And um, <laughs> the, um, go back one, sorry. So the gentleman in the middle on the left picture, we're talking and he keeps trying to measure a pipe and everybody else is talking. He's trying to like get it looped up and everybody's like talking because he's talking as he's doing it. So I finally like reached over and and held the, the tape because he was still working and everybody else is talking. He's like, no, that's great, but I need to measure this um, pipe. So that's the next <laughs> slide is me actually helping to measure the pipe as, it, as we're chatting. And then there's the the um, the finished product for the for the um, the park. So just uh, another highlight of the great work that our maintenance crew does. Next slide. Um, Akatik Park uh, Dam, that dam project, um, uh, trail project is, um, well, it's open for, what am I looking at? It's, people can use it right now? Yes. yes. It's open for use. We're going to be um, organizing a um, ribbon cutting slash event. We're not sure if it's going to coincide with National Trails Day in June, but this is a really huge um, project that was done. It's a phenomenally beautiful um trail system and we'll have more pictures and photos and invitations coming soon. Next slide. Um, as uh, Kyle mentioned, uh, Saturday was Earth Day. Um, really, it's not just the staff that came out um, um, to do it, but really the forethought and um, not sort of giving up um, at all when the forecast and topper shut keep saying that it's going to, you know, be 
you know, horrible weather. Uh, we got out there and said, come early, come at 10. And people really did show up. I can't imagine what that would have looked like had it been Friday. There were, um, it was packed. People were, were um, not packed, but people were really at 10 o'clock. That line was all the way out um, to the street to get in because they really wanted to, um, to come. And I also want to, you know, in addition to the people that you were talking to, that pitch photo on the top after the skies did open up. And it just started pouring down and everybody's all the our patrons and, and vendors and everybody's running to their car. You know, these people in this photo stayed because tables still had to be put up, chairs had to be stacked. Um, so there there's a reason I have to explain that. So there's a reason why everybody in that photo looks the way they do in that photo, because it had been it had been rained on for hours and hours and hours, and it just becomes it's just so so um thank you so much, every all of all staff for everything you did. Next slide. Um, Patriot Park North um, opening. Uh, there's a video um, highlighting there was thousands of or hundreds of kids in the cutest baseball, baseball outfits you've ever seen. Um, not talking about the 16 year olds. I think they'd be offended by cute, but these little tiny, you know, mm -hmm. kids in these cute outfits. It's just the cutest thing in the world. Um, next slide. Look at wow. I did get it in. <laughs> <laughs> My selfie. So, huh? I, cause I'm yes. Um, <laughs> she's that good. I'm that good. Uh, so that was the selfie. Um, oh, you were so amazed. Okay. One, two. Uh, we're, we're here at Patriot Park to celebrate the opening of this magnificent uh, facility. This is a state-of-the-art athletic facility for youth and adult sports with, with baseball. It's um, really rare, one of a kind, to have a turf uh, baseball field and to have this many uh, softball baseball fields in one location not only help serve our community, uh, but will help us host tournaments and other big special events uh, here in Fairfax County. So it's a great day. We finally made it, uh, and here we are uh, celebrating the opening. We're also here to celebrate the SYA opening day for their baseball season, which is a phenomenal um, combination of events. We had a parade, we had baseball players, we had softball players, we had children on the playground, we had people walking dogs, we had a ribbon cutting. It was a phenomenal day, way to spend um, a Saturday morning. So the Park Authority is a unique department in that we take projects from the cradle to the grave. So design, um, architecture, construction, project management, all the way up to right now of running and managing this park are all done and managed by Park Authority employees. They put their heart into this project. It was a phenomenal example of what we can do um, when we put our minds to it and with the adequate funding. But in addition to that, we made sure that we treated the land in a respectful way. We had archeologists, we had natural resources um, people, who planners who work with the community, with the elementary school in the neighborhood. It was a lot of, of different talents that came together to build this facility. And we're just so proud of all the work that they all did. So some of the unique features that we have is we're standing on um, the elevated press box, which allows people to watch the games and scouts to come in and scout out opponents. So we're wired for streaming capability. So if you're not able to come to your, your child's tournament, you can log in and watch the game from the comfort of your, your own home. We've got cameras. Um, it's just a really great facility. We also have um, warm-up areas, which is really unique for this um, type of facility. And the playground. The playground is phenomenal. It's really important that when you come to um, a game at this facility that all of your kids have something to do. So you're playing and then when you're waiting in, in between games, you can go to the playground. Or if you bring a sibling, the sibling has something to do to go to the playground. It really is a complete park experience. Well, it's really important to the county because, you know, a lot of our families uh, travel long distances to go to tournaments and other events and sometimes scratch their head and wonder why we have to travel that far. Why don't we have facilities like this in the county? And this is a magnificent facility. We have great facilities all over the county, but a lot of our facilities aren't sized to host big events. And so why this is important to the county is that we can host those big events. Hopefully some people uh, closer to home. 
But when we're not hosting those big events, this amazing facility is available for our own kids to use all the time. And when they aren't using it, uh, we have an opportunity to host other regional things and bring people into Fairfax County from other parts of the area just to see what a wonderful uh, community we have here and, and what a great place to live and, and to play. Thank you. Nice job. <clears throat> Jump to the. No, fine. Okay. Um. We also since. Oh, that's loud. Um. We also since the uh, um last board meeting had the Blue Bells at the Bend, um festival on Saturday, April the eighth. Uh, we had the Ides of Bark, um, at Gristmill, um, and the Horse Expo at Frying Pan Farm Park, which had thousands of people attended the Horse Expo. It was wildly um, popular, seas of people, all just super appreciative um, of the ability to go in and see. They had different horse um, um, uh, breeds that went around the rink and we had um, archery on horseback. It was, it was, it was phenomenal. Um, next slide, I think that's it. No, do you want to, um... I, just, I didn't want to take you know him much better, so I didn't want to put um, this is up for you. Well, the picture here shows uh, Charles and Jackie Olin. Uh, Charles, um, who was really the uh, driving force beyond, behind the creation of, of the Roll Top Observatory and Observatory Park, died uh, two or three weeks ago on, on March 28th. Uh, his connection actually to the Turner Farm went back um, to uh, 1959 when Khrushchev visited the, visited the farm, uh, one of the operational dairy farms in, in, in Fairfax County. I think actually someone told me in 1948, Fairfax County was the top or the second dairy producing county in the nation. Oh, wow. So you think Wisconsin? No, Fairfax County. But so... He was in the honor guard that uh, that uh, performed performed that day. He was also in his marine officer career a um, a guided missile officer. So he had that connection to the Nike site. Observatory Park was the control facility, and there are still the the the, the remote access uh, uh, telescope here. Uh, and um, and there's still some underground facilities controlled the Nike missiles that were situated at Nike Park a little bit uh, west of that. In any event, Charles uh, was um, uh, uh, founded the Analyma Society. They they comprise many of the volunteers who have the free uh, to the public Friday night viewings at uh, uh, the Roll Top Observatory, including last uh, Friday. I think they I think Jeff said that the uh, Kretsch said that they had uh, over 300 people there, lines waiting to use the four telescopes in there. Um, but uh, Charles uh, was a, a big figure in Great Falls and great advocate for our parks, uh, and we will uh, truly miss him. So thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. And that's it. <clears throat> All right. What's going on, Lynn? Right. So um, uh, I'll be real quick for Lynn Wood. So, as we celebrate the shining career of Dan Sutherland and the likes of him, it's equally important that we keep in mind and keep appreciating the treasures we have at hand. So, starting from Jay and down all the crew that does a tremendous job, all the way down to the maintenance staff, especially. So, just I came across a little, little incident that in Oakmar that there was a lighting issue over there, and the way I saw Mike Harris work over there, I mean, above and beyond, it's unbelievable. So this, that's what you take pride in. And that's what, I mean, we can talk about people and people are leaving and all that, but it's equally important to acknowledge that when they are doing a great job. That's one thing. And also among our sister organization, especially at NCS, if you see Taryn Avasado, her staff, they're doing a great job, especially your coach, Lori Barb, which you call Coach Barb. So all this, when, whenever you have a question like this, where there's a problem with the group or anything other problem, you see how the whole chain of this team, this, this, this basically uh, the whole, whole communication and whole uh, coordination works. And then you see the system at work. 
So that I just wanted to acknowledge it and thank everybody who has been involved and in keeping up the day-to-day -day work. And, and that's it with that, I'll pass. Michael? <laughs> Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Patriot Park's a big deal for at least in my life because the the desire to find a baseball complex started when I was first appointed to the athletic council sometime I don't know I, I think James Madison might have been president at that point um but we work real hard and and when I joined the park party board um and sat with Pat Harity it was one of the priorities was you know try to figure this out um a lot of people worked really hard and, and it turned out really well. One person who unfortunately wasn't there, um, but I really do feel deserves to be called out, especially here is Dave Bowden. Mm. Dave worked yeah. really hard. I mean, Dave was the guy who sat at public meetings with me, explaining to neighbors that the lights weren't going to go into their backyards and keep their children awake and, and disrupt their ability for their animals to sleep and, and all those kinds of things. Um, Dave worked, work, I mean, he was at those first meetings. Um, uh, Gary Flather, Rob Hani, and the folks at SYA. Um, people forget there was a small park there, LLV. SYA, at their expense and their dime, went into that space like 20 years ago and carved out a 90 foot diamond and two 60 foot diamonds um, and then maintain and then paid to maintain them. Um, and worked very, very hard on that space. And so working with them as we got the bigger space around it and turned it into this big complex. Um, clearly, you know, Pat Harity and, the, and, and other members of the Board of Supervisors um, came behind it in a big way. Um, the voters were kind enough to, to put real bond money behind it. I mean, it, I mean, it was a $22 million project. Um, and I remember you know, discussions when should we do this? Do we want to do this? What should we spend the money on other things? And I have to tell you that sitting there, I, I went back a couple of days later and just walked around and I was like, from nothing to this. And knowing how not only how many kids are going to enjoy it from our community, but the fact that we already have so many tournaments already booked on it um, as part of the sports tourism task force stuff, which I'm which I'm lucky enough to be part of. It's just it's a big deal. But there's also I just a special shout, and and I can't name them all. The staff here at the Park Authority worked their tails off to make this happen, um, at all levels, and not just the event itself, but all the community phone calls, all the questions. There, who knew? There is literally in the master plan of that poor little community an access road, like a a cut in for a road that they all looked at and thought we were going to use that as the road to get into the park. And so they all thought we were going to be driving right through their neighborhood to get into the park. And, and the number of folks that, that took all those phone calls and, and answered all those questions, who went through those public meetings, who did all the planning, who, who did all the work, who, who oversaw the, the putting of the shovels in the ground and the getting it done and who are going to run it. So it's just, it's, it was a lot of effort. And I think in the end, it's, it's proven to be worth it. But there's just a shout out to, to everybody involved in something that was, I mean, I mean, literally, it's probably something I've been working on for 15, 17 years or something. Um, and then, of course, thank you to this board for supporting the process, because there was, I, I still remember the conversations when at one point we thought it was Patriot Park or a re or, or money into a rec center and, and weren't sure what we could do. And Linwood wanted all the money from Mount Vernon. No. <laughs> but um, so just thank you, everybody. It was it was a great it, it was obviously a great event, but. More importantly, it's a great facility. So um, thank you, everybody, for getting that done. Cynthia? Yes. So in general, I just want to thank uh, the park um, staff for all that they do because um, they just um, make it look so easy. And we know it's not. We know it's a lot of hard work. So thank you. Um, on my behalf uh, for um, uh, Franconia District. Uh, again, I also appreciated the help with um, the meeting with Supervisor Lusk. That went well. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kyle. And um, thank you all for helping with that. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Linwood. So I want to uh, thank everybody, all the staff that uh, 
helped coordinate the uh, Eyes of Arc uh, two weeks ago now. It was uh, a wonderful, uh, well attended uh, event. And uh, E.J. Linwood. Yeah, I, I want to. I want to thank Jay for coming also. And when Jay showed up, I just knew I was going to make the slideshow. And then she came over and she took a picture of my wife and I. Okay, and I knew I was going to be in the slideshow. <laughs> and then, and then I was in a picture with Jay, so I knew. You I knew. Was going to be a slide. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to admit, your choice of pictures for the slideshow <laughs> was the right decision. <laughs> Cassidy is much more pleasant to look at than me. <laughs> uh, uh, so, for the record, we're all competing to be in your slideshow. Right. <laughs> slideshow that I by myself create every two weeks completely by myself and don't look at it for the first time during this meeting. Thank you, Allison. And you're getting me in trouble, but yes. <laughs> Jim? I can't follow that up. <laughs> Good deal. Ken? I just want to uh, <clears throat> add on to what's already been said by Faisal and Mike. Uh, with regard to uh, our staff, I think... Uh, Dan Sutherland and some of the others we've acknowledged in the past meetings exemplify our staff. And it's uh, it's gold medal. Mm -hmm. If there were such a thing, uh, Sarah can work on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gold medal staff. Uh, we had our own uh, Earth Day in Providence and uh, had a good turnout. It was a Friday before. Uh, Earth Day. Had a good turnout and staff was there to conduct a walk through a park and explain uh, the different plants and how they got there and, and the ones that shouldn't be there and, and stay away from the poison ivy. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> very, very well done. And uh, lastly, uh, this Saturday, it is the annual Park Authority Healthy Strides 5K, 10K at Burke Lake. This is the only... Best Lake Park in the county. Footnote. Oh, okay. God. <laughs> but uh, there's a 5K and a 10K, and, and those that don't want to run can walk. And they can walk the 5K. It's uh, I've, I've been out there several years. It's a good turnout. Staff does a great job. And uh, if you're not doing anything Saturday and the, the weather holds, uh, come out and walk, walk at Burke Lake. Tim, yeah, thank you, uh, Kyle. Uh, thank you, Jay, for yielding your time about uh, on uh, Charles Olin. Uh, also, uh, Jay came up to Riverbend uh, for the uh, Bluebell Festival, and the Bluebells cooperated. They were still in full bloom. Uh, gorgeous uh, uh, walk there along the uh, Potomac Heritage Trail along, along the river. And staff not only from Riverbend, but again, uh, uh, authority wide uh, was present with various displays and uh, entertainments, and it was just a terrific day. So, thank you all. Well, I just want to add to the thanks for a fantastic Earth Day celebration. Um, what used to be known as Spring Fest, and you could tell people were so eager and hungry to come back to that. So I'm, I'm very, very happy. Um, I'm sorry it got rained out, but I really appreciate all the work that went into that. It's out there at the Sully Historic Site, and it's so important. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Allison, we got nothing else, right? All right. With that, this meeting is adjourned. All right. Very good. Well done. <laughs>